Good afternoon, good afternoon everybody. I hope you had an amazing day. Welcome to another beautiful sunset safari live from the African bush. And we have started with a herd of impalas and these are still some very pregnant females. They have not yet dropped any lambs for the season. So it is interesting to see that they are holding on for so long. My name is Tess. I'll be taking you out on safari on rooster. Behind the camera today is Mpo. And we are wondering why there is such a big gap between the other impalas that have lambed and there's a large part of the herd that hasn't lambed that are kind of sticking to the shady patches on such a hot day. Now I know there was a really late rut. It lasted much longer than usual. So that explains why some of the females might still be pregnant. It's definitely not due to do due to the rainfall this year because it's been throughout the year but that could have maybe contributed to the males extending the rut and some females maybe delaying their estrus for some reason fascinating but let me know what you think when you think these girls are going to be lambing we are live we are interactive and we love to hear from you so please if there is anything you want us to find for you if there's any suggestions that you have on anything we might be seeing maybe you can see something that we can't please let us know You can see by the way that this female on the right is standing that she's very pregnant. Oh Bruce that makes my heart very happy. I'm also wildly excited. I hope it's going to be incredibly successful. We had some luck this morning with the wild dogs so maybe they'll be around later. But, but I think overall today it's going to be a fantastic day. We've had a few days of overcast cold windy weather. Today is up to 26 degrees Celsius so that's 78 degrees Fahrenheit. Not nearly as hot as our usual summer days. But it does mean that the animals might be a little happier. Especially the birds, the insects and the herbivores. So that's what I'm hoping for. I'm wanting to do some dam hopping today. I'm wanting to look for some birds, some insects, some flowers after the rain. And bonus if we manage to find some predators and elephants. So at this time of the day, if you find impalas in the sun, that's how you know it's not an excruciatingly hot day. <laughs> They've left the shade to start feeding. There's only a few that are sticking to the shadows. And you'll probably find it's mostly the pregnant females that are sticking to the shade. They're already hot enough and using energy to grow a lamb. They can take a bit of a break. You'll see the herd is completely spread out across the open area of quarantine. Under every tree there's a nice patch of shade. You'll find impalas. And the grass is now so long that we can't even see where the nursery herd is. Or the creche. It's just a whole lot of adults sticking up above the grass. I'm sure you can hear all of those woodland kingfishes calling and some doves. I'm really excited for this change in weather and what it's going to mean for safari today. But speaking of, I think it is time to have a look at what the weather is doing everywhere for the afternoon, not just in Juma. Cloudy and 25 degrees, I'm not so certain that is the case. The sun is a blazing on us and it's hot, it's not 25. So, whoever the weatherman is has got that horribly wrong. Anyway, my name is Tristan. On camera, I've got Rian this afternoon. Let's try not to crash. Um, and we hope that you are all ready and looking forward to a good afternoon on safari. I just want to check something quickly. I thought I saw something in a tree far in the distance, but I'm not sure what it is just yet. 
I think it might just be a branch, but I just want to get my binos and have a proper scan. Yeah, it's just a branch that's hanging down. Way off in the distance there was just a kind of a, a branch that's blowing and it was hanging down and with the leopard when you got wind, um, the wind often just blows the tail slightly. So when you see movement high up on a tree, it's always worth just stopping and going back. So it's just double checking. Um, I wasn't confident that it was anything, but worth having a little look. Now, our plan for this afternoon is we're going to go and pop in quickly just to see if the dogs are still here on our side. Just relocate them so we get that sighting running. We won't stay with them all afternoon because they're going to rest now for a while. And then we're going to go off and we're going to just mill about and scratch and just see what else is here. And then we're going to go back to the dogs hopefully later and hope that they come onto Juma. They ride on the boundary so I don't want to leave it till later and then they run off out of Juma and we don't see them. So I think let's go and spend some time with them while we can and then we'll obviously come back a little bit later when they're a little bit more active depending on what happens. If there's no body coming um, and we're not, there's not a lot of vehicle pressure which I suspect there will be because of where it is um, then we'll stay because um, dogs are, are one of my favorite animals and given that I have a, one of my closest friends is the wild dog research of the area um, lots to talk about with wild dogs and I've done lots of cool things with him this year um, so it'll be cool to spend some time with dogs um, so hopefully they decide to stay more on the Juma side and don't cross out onto Arethusa but that's going to be the plan whether or not that plan sort of works out remains to be seen but at least we have a plan It's actually a beautiful afternoon and I said it's hot but it's still really nice to be out. Um, it's something about these post rain days that is always nice when you, the clouds clear and the sun comes out and you end up with this beautiful greenery that comes through and these blue skies with these little fl white fluffy clouds. It's just pleasant and pretty and there's insects and it feels like life everywhere with the birds kind of moving around. I'm a huge fan of a post-rain summer day. Um, I'm not a fan of being out on game drive in the rain, but post all of that is decent. Oof, this poor road. So there's a big white car that's about to come past. I just want to let both of these cars go and uh, not sort of sit in a convoy. In the meantime, though, let's send you across to Tess, who's also looking at something in the clouds. <laughs> how perfect that you were saying it Tristan but our pretty bird with the fluffy clouds behind and decided to leave <laughs> I'm not very surprised by this though because um, it's a bird so unfortunately they do tend to fly away quite quickly I guess I'll have to do better than that but that was a lilac breasted roller that little flash of neon that you got some lilac some neon blue some royal blue some green some white some brown absolutely stunning bird and very aptly, as rollers do, chose the one little dead twig sticking up to hawk from. But look at that, fluffy white clouds, you can hear more birds. Perfection, such good timing. But that is part of our plan and I was very happy that we found ourselves not only a patch of shade, but also a pretty bird with the fluffy white clouds. I'll have to find you some more. Now we had some exceptional luck this morning, let me tell you. Myself and Paul managed to find the Bataliers on Ingwe Alley building a nest, which is the first time I have ever seen in my life actively adding to a nest and building it and shaping it. So we are going to go and check on them. I think that would be brilliant. And hopefully they are there and being active because they are fairly dark in color those black feathers over the majority of the body they might be sticking to the shade but at the same time nice warm weather some thermals they might be up in the skies intermingling with those clouds maybe a little lower than that and soaring around looking for food too but i agree i think it's going to be an amazing day for birding so i suppose we need to go and find some more birds <laughs> There will be plenty more lilac breasted rollers, I assure you. Hopefully some purple rollers as well, that's my favourite roller. 
European rollers are around too. Oh, Aaron, what a question. First off, thank you for keeping me on my toes. I have no idea whether an iridescent bird would fly faster. I don't know if you have a particular theory behind this that makes you ask that, ask that question. Because iridescence, it's, it's the structure of the feather. It's, it's not like the feather is heavier or lighter, I wouldn't think. And I don't think birds without iridescence would be heavier or have any form of disadvantage when flying. So I wouldn't think that they necessarily fly faster just because they're iridescent. It might have more uh, might have more impact that, for example, the birds that are iridescent, like for example a virtual starling, has a very different structure to something like a lilac breasted roller or a batelier. Um, Size-wise, but also the sleekness of it, rollers are quite chunky birds, they're fairly large, um, they've got very big chest cavities, they're quite broad, where a virtual starling is kind of sleek, so maybe it's that as opposed to the iridescence. But do you have a particular theory in mind as you know what prompted what prompted that question? Because I can't think of a reason why an iridescent bird would necessarily be faster. I think maybe there's a trick of the eye with the reflecting feathers. Maybe it looks like it's going faster, like a flash of light reflecting back at you. I don't know. <laughs> it's about the best answer I can give, but maybe Tristan or or Andrew or one of the other naturalists can help out there if they've maybe ever read a paper on that but I can't think logically of a reason why iridescence might cause that so I don't think it is the case but I do think that the sleekness of the bird the weight of the bird that definitely would have an impact because some birds are specifically adapted for soaring and dropping quickly but others are adapted for being speedy in general interesting thank you see the tree where the battaliers are building the nest. Let's get closer. It's in the distance. I think there's a battalier there. Yay. I love me some good birding. I love the rain as well. Best predator sightings I've ever had in my life have been in the rain. Obviously there's always exceptions to the rule. Some have been in the heat of the day. On a hot, hot, hot day. But the first two days of sun after rain, it's just like everything comes to life with a whole new sense of vigor. It explodes with life. That rain is so vital and that's actually part of the reason we love the rain so much. Yes, we get wet, but we love it. We love the rain. It's so good. can see one. I'm going to move this a bit forward just so it's not silhouetted by that um, cloud. Oh, there's definitely a battalier in the nest. I can see the red of its face down at us. Wow. That is such a beautiful bird. So right at the top of the tree in that top, 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 very thick fork. There it is, the battalier nest. How cool is this? I don't know how often you have seen battaliers building nests, but for me, this is still wildly exciting. And I think it always will be. It's a whole new generation coming. But just sticking out of the top of the nest, you can see that kind of flit of red. That's the beak with a little bit of yellow on it too. The battalier sitting in full sun. That is fascinating. With black feathers, it's sitting in full sun. I suppose they are quite well adapted as well to, to cool the body down. Oh, that is amazing. I wonder if the others are going to come back while we're here.
lovely afternoon here at Pridelands, Eco Training Pridelands. Overcast weather, it is nice and mild. I won't say it's cool, it's not hot. I think it's a very good day, a very good afternoon for finding animals. As you can see, I already have some impala going there. I did see one or two lambs in this herd, but I can't see where they are now. Maybe they somewhere. Most of our females have dropped now. And we're starting to see quite a number of them around. Just overall a very nice little scene. Typical Lowfeld Bushfeld scene with the impala, the green grass and the likes. My name is Chris and with me on camera is still Mr. Panda Glitz. And we even have Morris with us today, uh, who's our eco-training tracker. He's going to try and assist us to find some animals. And what we've decided, uh, we know that the Ngati Pride is around somewhere. We just don't know exactly where. We've got a feeling that they're trying to follow that herd of buffalo we saw this morning. Uh, we're going to try and locate the buffalo now. That's what we're going to try and do. And if, once we've found the buffalo, we're going to backtrack and see if the lions are not perhaps trailing them. All right. While I do that, let's quickly go over to Tessa. We are being spoiled with bird sightings already. The female battalier is sitting at the nest that's still being constructed. Look how she's just splayed her wings out. You can see them just bright, bright, bright white underneath. She's cooling off. So the white feathers are reflecting heat and allowing her to cool down, but also having her wings off of her body exposes all of that surface area to the wind up there. There's no wind, but there will be a breeze up there. And she can cool off. It's just beautiful. Not very often we get lucky enough to see that with the Batalia. Like she lost her balance there. Now I know this is the female because the male has very different markings of the primaries, which are the feathers you can see coming down the bottom of the wing on the underside. In a male, those are black, very, very black, almost to half. Hers are majority white. Oh. Are you going to fly off? She looks like she's getting ready to move. Yeah, I'm going to go hopping up. Look at that brilliant red and yellow. Absolutely gorgeous female. And very big, you bet, but being she would easily take me between my knee and my hip in height if we were standing next to each other on the ground. Stunning. Uh, we're going to spend a bit more time. Hopefully the male comes back to add to the send you to Tristan in the meantime. Well, while Tess is looking at back, we've managed to relocate on the dogs. They weren't very far from where Tess left them. You know, just under a bush that was at first looked like they're not here. If you drive on this road, you'll never know there's a pack of wild dogs next to the road. Um, it's not even 20 meters off the road, but there is a zero, 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 zero visual of them. Uh, the grass is long, the bush is dense, and so it's only kind of because I roughly knew where Tess was talking about that we were able to find them pretty quickly. Um, but the pack is all sleeping as they would be. Um, this is the time of day where they rest. We know how busy they are and how much to move around. And so, you know, they try and find time during the day to rest, especially when it's hot. Uh, it's not the time for them to be overexerting themselves and they can overheat very, very quickly. Um, it's an animal that needs shade in order to be all right during the hot summer months in this part of the world. In fact, most animals actually. That's why you'll find that very little veterinary work is done between the sort of hours of 10, 30, 11 and uh, 2 o'clock. 
three o'clock is because the sun is just too hot and animals dehydrate very very quickly and if the dart goes in and for example the animal runs a little bit and then it goes down and you can't find it and it's in the sun it can die from it so they try and do it in the cooler times particularly now this particular pack for those of you that have been wondering who it is i spoke to grant about them today so grant is is the researcher for wild dogs within this entire ecosystem um, for EWT um, and he heads up pretty much most of the, the sort of dog and even I think he's even doing cheetahs now too um, within this area um, but this pack comes from is a split Central Kruger so I asked him where Central Kruger is but he uh, is obviously in the field because it only got one tick so he's probably looking for dogs down in Malalan somewhere I know he's been down that side. Um, so I'm not sure exactly which area of Kruger, um, but the, the pack name or the pack that they've split off from that has the collar is LPBM. Um, so LP is the, the scientific name and the BM, I always forget what it stands for. So I did ask Grant, but he <laughs> hasn't come back to me. But each pack has a different LPB um, configuration. So it will be the, the fourth letter changes. So it'll be BG or BL. Um, so the investic pack was BL, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and that's all how they, basically when they do the coloring, there's genetic samples that are taken. There's been all kinds of stuff that they've done over the course of the last few years to try and protect wild dogs within this Kruger ecosystem. And so those codes plus the number tells them exactly which individual they've done. And, and when you do this process, process um, is you do the dot obviously goes into the dog the dog goes down the dog then gets carried normally to a vehicle and if it's in Kruger um, the state vet Louis he's got a vehicle that's perfectly set up for wild dogs he's even got like little ropes that you can prop their leg up and all kinds of things um, and the collar is put on while the collar is put on a fecal sample is taken a sample from the nose um, and then they take a little hair sample um, and then a photograph of both lateral sides of wild dogs. So um, it's one of the things that is very difficult for researchers is unlike leopard where you want a facial shot or lions where you can count whisker spots in wild dogs, the researchers don't want anything to do with their face. They want lateral presentation from the dogs. So side profiles because each dog's um, entire coat is like a fingerprint so left and right um, that gets then plugged into an AI system which is absolutely incredible you put in pictures of wild dogs and it spits out which dog it is and the history of that dog which is pretty crazy so that's something that I know they're working on to try and make available to the public at some point um, which will be quite incredible um, but yeah then they basically once they confirm that it's a certain dog they can then add it to of images that can come up but anyway so that whole kit then gets a number which is LPB in this case M and then 01 or 02 or 12 or whatever it may be um, and they then have this database of all these wild dogs that they've got um, and they can then genetically kind of figure out what's going on and they also then do their studies around rabies distemper and all of those kind of things with it um, so it's very very interesting to accompany um, Grant and, and the team when they go and do these these wild dog um, collarings and, and the collars are important because I know from a photographic point of view and from a tourist point of view collars don't seem like a great idea but you must understand that within this greater Kruger system and, and the, the movement of dogs is so big that without collars it's very 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 difficult to figure out what's going on with them um, and when they collar they try and time the collaring to pre denning season so that the collars are working when the dens happen and that allows them to find dens to then see how many puppies are being born what is the mortality rate of those puppies and how um, the dogs are actually doing um, and it's been fascinating to watch the data of these dogs over the years I mean Grant sends me things all the time about the movement patterns of dogs and there's some crazy stuff that happens with these dogs um, where they go into like these all of a sudden they move and they just cover huge distance in straight lines um, or they zigzag around and um, they're also trying out stuff now with with collars that have accelerometers fitted in them 
and there's some amazing data from that too. Um, they're able to work out what the pack is doing via the data that's being downloaded from the collar as to how the, the, the collar is moving. And they actually found one where they they got the data and the, it, there was a normal range of movement and then all of a sudden there was just this erratic all over the place movement and they went to where the collar was and they found that the lion had killed that wild dog and so it was obviously in the process of that dog trying to evade the lion that this erratic movement had taken place so they can start to piece together a wild dog's life when it's not being observed which is vitally important because a lot of the wild dogs of Kruger aren't viewed as much as you would think, um, so especially those in the far north, um, around um, Pufuri, um, the Shingwetsi dogs, uh, they go up, they go into Mozambique and Zimbabwe sometimes and into the communities. Um, so it's very important to understand what's going on with those guys and what they're getting up to and where they're kind of going and what their movement patterns are. So there's a, a lot that's happening within wild dogs. Um, and, and so that whole numbering system is how they typically ID them. And the reason why they go with that system rather than a naming of a pack is because anyone that's watched this show for long enough will know full well that the wild dogs do not stay in the same pack. I mean, the pack that we're talking about right now is a split off from another pack. And so things like, um, you know, when we used to say Investic pack, Sands pack, Ottawa pack, um, Toulon pack, these packs, they are kind of general uh, sort of pack IDs. They are so fluctuating all the time. Wild dog packs very seldom will stay the exact same for an entire year. So there'll be individuals that will disperse, individuals that will arrive, there'll be pups that will unfortunately die, adults that will die. And so there's a constant evolving of packs and movement of, of dogs within those packs. Um, it's not as defined as set up as what everybody always believed, that there was this alpha pair and that they would never leave the pack and everything would be absolutely fine. Um, it doesn't work like that in the wild dog world. Wild dogs are all over the place. And, and the reason for it is obviously there's a drive to mate within dogs. And so if they're not mating, and let's say this pack here is six males and two females, hypothetically. I, I don't know how many dogs we have here and I don't know what the composition is yet. But let's say hypothetically that's what we've got. Then on the fringe here, let's say the sands pack, if you want to call it that, they've got um, six females and one male. What you're going to find is is that these dogs, through running around and picking up scent, are going to realize that there's a heavy female presence around them, and therefore there's opportunity for them to start moving off and trying to find females. The females are going to pick up the same thing, and so females and males distribute away from their original packs, and they join together and they form new packs. And so this is how it goes, and that's why splits take place. Um, is animals are, are seeking out mating opportunities and it's also then to do with food availability. If a pack gets to the size where it's too big for an area to find enough food then you'll find individuals splitting off to try and then go um, and find areas that are more suitable and, and easier to survive. So wild dogs are, are fascinating creatures and a lot of this stuff is only down to the fact that you know people in Botswana, um, Kenya, Grant here in South Africa, um, coal that's down in the east, in the in Kazulu Natal that's part of EWT, DEWT as well. These guys are are really starting to make headway into wild dog life that we didn't understand before. So fascinating stuff. Anyway, we'll sit with them. Let's see what they get up to. If you aren't an explorer yet, here's a sneak peek at what you're missing. The amazing weekly newsletter. We handpick the best animal moments of the week. Our most interesting question that we received, hilarious unseen behind the scenes content, and exclusive previews of upcoming Wild Earth ventures. This is all packaged and personally delivered to your inbox with love from Wild Earth. Sign up and let us spoil you every week.
Well, they're still with the doggies, as you can see. They haven't moved much, and they won't move much now. Now's not the time to be with them. But like I say, because of where they are in the proximity to the boundary, if they wake up, they can be gone in two minutes, and we won't make it back here. So I thought it would be good just to switch and spend some time with them now while also there's no other cars we can be on our own we can enjoy them and not have to worry too much um, and that's why we're here we're not expecting there to be any crazy action between the dogs they they're going to wait until it gets much later before they start to move around now interestingly enough uh, grant actually just messaged me right now to say that the bm uh, they, it's it's basically the alphabetical order that they name the packs and all well, the collars in so BM, this is the 13th pack that they collared within the study that they are doing. So that's where the M comes from. Um, but it's a, it's a pretty pretty cool system that they have. Um, and what's interesting is he was telling me, because I asked him how far these dogs are moving, and he says that these dogs, the home range that they have is quite large even for Kruger standards. Um, this pack roams from here, the Sabi Sands now, um, they go all along the open road to Sitara basically, down to a uh, place called Liupan. So anyone that's familiar with the Kruger will, understand, will know where I'm talking about. Liupan, and then they come back towards Mbali, Hoya Hoya, and then obviously come into the Sabi Sands. It's a, a seriously large piece of area. Um, and they obviously moving a lot, um, as wild dogs do. And there was a wild dog that, that was here that moved crazy distances as well. I mean, he went past all the way up to sort of Pridelands and then from Pridelands cut northeast, eventually ended up in Mozambique and then back towards the Manuleti. So they uh, can cover serious ground, these guys. And it's because of the the nature of, of their body and the way that they are built. Uh, they are extremely fit and skinny and able to basically run marathons every day, which is quite amazing to watch and that's why they hunt so much there's a huge metabolic rate to power an animal to run those kind of distances so they always need to get food in and if you're a pack animal with multiple mouths to feed as well as an endurance animal it means that food is, is something that you need all the time and so lots of hunting takes place but on the hunting side wild dogs are not nearly as efficient as everybody thinks they are um, you know you ask anybody or you read any book and they'll tell you wild dogs have a 70 percent hunting rate it's not how it works um, with wild dogs and uh, it's actually a very interesting thing um, thing that goes with hunting but talking about hunting it sounds like andrew's got a bird that's hunting so we'll pick this up after we've been to him Thanks very much and hello everyone. It is so good to be back. I'm so happy to be back in the driver's seat here and back with you all. And uh, yeah, we thought we would just start off here with the secretary bird nest, but slowly disappearing behind that hill over there. But yeah, I'll give it a bit of time. Maybe they pop out again. Yeah, so hello again. My name is Andrew and I do have Morgan with me behind camera. And uh, I must say I've had a very good rest and I'm just so excited to be back with all of you again. So here we are. And uh, definitely back in the place that I call home for the last four years or so. So let's just see if uh, the secret or the secretary bird is going to pop out again. There we go. It's a very warm day out here today. I believe it's uh, close to 40 degrees Celsius, which is one of the hotter days we've had this summer up until now. Myself and Morgan, we are. Yo, we are battling in this heat at the moment, but we've got water, we've got plenty of sunblock as well, and ready to have a good time with you all. And I think you can actually see the heat waves from, from your view over there, if you have a look on the, the far hill over there. It... Ah, Chelsea, thanks very much. Yeah, it's good to be back. I'm happy to be back here. Yeah, 12 days, it's a nice leave, but it's a little bit too long. I start to miss being in the bush, so I'm just glad to be back with uh, Morgan, of course. And here we are, out in Ambakala Game Reserve. No, it's a great day. And it's definitely one of those days when uh, you return, and it's one of the hottest days in summer, like today. But who knows, in the next few days, maybe it's going to cool down. Or maybe we get some rain in the, the following following week, or maybe even the weekend. 
Okay, it doesn't look like a secretary bird is going to pop out now. So we are pretty close to the nesting site and this adult was uh, was foraging. And we're just going to see if this adult is going to pop out again. Yeah, I must say after 12 days being away, I'm very curious to see how those those chicks are doing. I'm sure they're doing quite well. And it's quite nice that uh, I had a sighting of some rock kestrels when I when I came in this morning. And uh, very nice to know that the rock kestrels have returned. I think maybe even the Amur falcons, which was called the Eastern Red-Footed Kestrels. That was their previous name. I believe they've made a return as well. So looking forward to seeing them out here. And if we just stop and just give a moment of silence, you can actually hear the breeze is starting to pick up now. Definitely better for us and better for the game viewing is when it starts to cool down and definitely starting to cool down now. Okay, so I believe uh, Tessa has got a bird of prey building a nest, so I'm going to send you through to her. Sounds like it's going to be a very entertaining afternoon. I certainly hope that everybody has as much fun as Mpo and I are having this afternoon. We just feel so lucky to be witnessing such a special moment. I mean, when do you ever get to actually witness battleers building a nest? And especially this morning when we found it, we really couldn't believe it. You know, seeing this battalier fly in with a twig and he repositioned it in the nest and started kind of climbing into it and patting it out and rearranging here and there. That is really, really special. I can hear a plane. That completely distracted my mind. But, I mean, back to the very special moment that this is. I think even more so knowing what we know about battaliers, this morning was incredibly rare because we had two battaliers come in and start rearranging the nest while she was sitting on a branch lower down. She wasn't involved in that process. Normally one battalier builds the nest and it's the male. The fact that she wasn't involved, I'm fascinated to know who the other one was. Oh, Spice, it's good to hear from you. I don't think she's laid an egg yet. I think the chances of that right now are fairly low, purely because this is a pretty small nest at the moment. It doesn't look like it, but it is pretty small. So she, she would need it to be a little bit bigger. I would think it can get as wide as a meter. The size it is now, I would think, is maybe... 50 centimeters across so half that size she can use a nest this size but but in my mind I think that they want to make it a little bigger before they lay an egg in there because she only has one egg they lay one egg pretty much every single brood and only if they lose it really really early on will they lay a second egg but other than that they just skip the breeding season if they've lost a chick or an egg they wait until next year they've only got one egg and one chick so I would think they want it to be a little bit bigger because if you look, you can see the sky through that nest. Look in between the twigs, you can see those gaps, you can see the sky. It's not a very solid nest yet. I think they're busy building, it can take six weeks to build. I think they're busy building and she's going to lay an egg sometime in December. And I don't think it'll be early December, I think it'll be from about halfway through December, maybe a bit later. She'll lay an egg and then they'll incubate it together, they take turns incubating at least. All of them on the, the success of this nest, the stability of this nest. And I'm just absolutely fascinated that there were two different battaliers building it together while she sat on the side. Is that a previous chick that's already got its adult plumage and is helping? Is it a another male? I don't know. But I'd love to see them come back. That's why we're sitting here. We're playing the patience game, hoping for the biggest reward. That these two males or the two that were building the nest come back and 
and show us, you know, are they both male? Is one looking a little younger than the other? What might cause that? Because from what we know, almost every single time, only the male builds the nest. But I suppose that also feeds into the conversation of how much do we actually know? Because if you look at some of the facts in books, in documentaries, in anything, a lot of it is incorrect and it's based on what we thought we knew quite a while ago across the world and, and whatever. We thought we knew a lot and the more we observe, the more we learn every single day. There's still things we learn about hyenas and leopards every single day just from observing them, things people always say they would never do. So it would be impossible to document every battalier building its nest. Only a fraction, wow, that was a big yawn. Only a fraction would have been documented. And so I suppose maybe the whole family builds the nest and we just didn't know it. Maybe this is a really momentous moment and we're documenting it. <laughs> a, a, you know, a very rare thing that maybe hasn't been documented a lot before. I wonder if she's genuinely tired or if that was to get some oxygen in to get ready for a flight. Maybe even to cool down a little bit, exposing the inside of her mouth to the air. Wow. Absolutely fascinating. I feel like it's going to be a very lucky day. Right, our buffaloes have gone far east, so far that um, it's now beyond our signal range and they're very likely heading straight towards Boston where we don't traverse unless Morris somehow has a plan. Oh, here they are. Goodness, 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 goodness. Then there's another track of buffalo. Oh, goodness. That might have been then Dugger Boys. Oh, here's a whole bunch of them. Carpeta, uh, can I join you? Actually, accidentally joined you here. Yeah, make the way. All right, so that they deceived us. Somewhere they must have crossed and we didn't get their tracks all the way back to Ndlovo Dam. There's a whole bunch of them to the left here. Yeah? So I just want to keep a bit of distance because they do seem a, a touch nervous. All right, there's our first goal for the afternoon done. Nice. Let's see what we can do here. We'll reposition in a moment or two. spread out here. It's like in little bits and bobs. Some of them are down at the water, some are sort of midway, some are up here on the slope. But we will reposition soon. Right, well, like I said, we're still sitting with our dogs. They haven't done much at the moment. Um, you wouldn't expect them to do anything. They uh, are fast, fast, fast asleep at this stage. Um, they are only going to get going. I've, what's the time now? 20, uh, 20 past 4. 
I reckon only half past five we'll start to see them moving. Um, so for now it's just going to be sleeping um, and just trying to take it easy. Just letting one of the guides know, sorry, I'm just trying to get him into position. So are going to start coming now which is what i expected um there should be quite a few cars unfortunately because of where we are we're on a boundary it's gonna be a fairly busy sighting the one good thing though is that you can't actually see them from the road you need to in area or in juma to see them um, and so only the guys that can traverse juma will be able to to pick them up but you'll see when a car comes every now and then one of the adults will stand up it's very typical wild dog behavior don't worry um, they did the exact same thing when we arrived dogs do this um, they just stand up just to make sure nothing is coming and there's no sort of threat with the oncoming vehicle um, sometimes you know vehicles follow leopards and lions and hyenas and so they always just check you'll love us uh, the rabies conversation is an, an interesting one um, vaccinations have been tried um, with them so either they can do a dropout dart or an oral vaccination um, obviously oral vaccinations are difficult because it's got to be in a piece of meat and each dog's got to get one so it's quite tricky um, but yeah they have tried it and they've had success with the rabies vaccination the distemper on the other hand no so distemper they're still figuring out but Grant I'm trying to remember now he was telling me something the other day I, you know we talk a lot because basically what happens is whenever I, I, I'm in Hoodspray I spend time with Grant and Ben and Ben is a vet and so all we do is talk about veterinary and wild dogs and what I do basically in safari um, and we just that's pretty much our conversations all the time um, so it gets but kind of complicated and convoluted between all the drugs and all the things that are being used by Ben and Grant and so um, but I think they're saying that an oral vaccination now or um, distemper that they want to soon um, and that will be the next project to try to get that right um, and then sort them out uh, but yeah, there's been a marked reduction um, for a number of reasons with of, of the rabies situation with wild dogs um, obviously this vaccination that they did they did a big drive and I think it was when was it 2000 I say 2015 14 15 they did all of this maybe even earlier than that um, to try and sort out a lot of the, the rabies issues um, and then what they've done also is on the fringes of of the Kruger is there's been a massive amount of work done with vaccinating um, domestic animals on the outside. Um, so a lot of the, the vet students, vet assistants, um, even the vets themselves do, uh, do sort of inoculation where so they'll come into the communities, treat the animals for free, um, try and actually get the situation where they're trying to get the rabies kind of lowered in the area and it's made a difference like I say I mean I haven't heard a lot of rabies related incidents with with dogs within the Kruger system since all of that's been taking place um, but yeah there's a vaccination they do all right I'm still sleeping as they will um, and so while they sleep let's send you across to Chris who's found something far larger and far less energetic look of a buffalo, even if it's a cow. She's just looking down at the rest. Ah, oh, they're coming closer towards us now, the rest of them, yeah? to those others just now to our right. Right here, Panda, to our right. It's in a duck so you can pan to them. Okay. Yeah, 
Here they come. This is a nice sizable herd. I judge about 150 roughly. Oh, there's a little one. A tiny little calf. That is minute. And a very small calf. Looky looky. <laughs> Gosh, it's still wobbly. And that's mere days old. That's very tiny. I don't know where they stare at us. <laughs> this is what they do on foot as well. I actually had this very same thing the other day. I was up in Makileke doing a trail. And we encountered them on foot and this whole herd like this came right up to us and stopped about 30 meters from us. White mane wants to know why buffalo manes have hairy pinal sheaths. White mane, I don't know, to be honest with you. I can only assume it's got to do with protection to keep unwanted substances out of the orifice of the sheath. We see that in cattle as well. Very inquisitive creatures. Sometimes on foot they do this. Like I said, they'll come and check you out. If they're in a herd like this. All right, and so this is objective number one achieved for this afternoon. This is a lovely sighting. So often we get them in the open and stationary like this.
like I said, objective number one. Done and dusted. To sit down around a fire in conversation is a practice as old as mankind. There is an ancient sense of magic about sharing and learning as embers twirl into the night sky. Here at Wild Earth, we see the value of this practice and want to retain it in an age where so much divides us. If you sign up to be an explorer, you can join in this gathering and return to the ritual of connection with Wild Earth. I'll string something together about these ones here, about the camouflage. Okay. Okay. Well, not anymore. This one's straight ahead, it's still here. Okay. She'll blow those. We are looking at something here in Medicare, everybody. Very good afternoon. You see the movement. We are looking at the grey ghosts of the bush as you are joining us on this. It is a Tuesday afternoon, hey VK. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kevin. Behind the camera, we've got PK and we've got a herd of kudu in the thickets here. And we wanted to show you how well they are camouflaged. Just look at that. Especially when they move into... So we're going to semi-lose sight of her and then she'll come into view again. Somewhere there. I see that white stripes on the flanks and that just serves to actually break up the body shape and that is what why they're there for and you can here you can see it in real time in practice
I counted about four, five cows here. Dorcas, they've all got those white lines and it's actually quite a characteristic of the actual family that kudus uh, belong to and now we're referring to kudu and yala bushbuck they all got those white stripes on the flanks and i'm going to quickly reposition you i'm sure if we push back a little bit that i'm going to get your visual again i don't want to spook them but I do want to give, give you a better view. And I'm sure we'll see them. Let me just push back. Somewhere here, BK will pick up on them again. I'm fairly certain of that. Through there, BK. Let's do that. Let's do that. in the shade there. You see, if you have to quickly browse and look, you'll very, very easily overlook them. Now, normally with Kudu, the first defense or line of the fence will be they will either freeze or flee and here you can see freeze well that one is browsing but they normally going to stand dead dead star all right everybody i'm glad i could bring you that the gray goats let's go over to andrew Okay, so we have at least two of the juveniles that are lying down at the moment. The adult that we saw earlier on did disappear uh, behind the topography of the land. So we've just parked off here and we're watching these, uh, these young ones. Look at that beautiful face, eh? So it's difficult to see how much they've grown. Of course, they would have grown in the time that I was away. But uh, to see exactly how much they've grown from the position that they're lying, it's a little bit difficult. Uh, hoping they're gonna maybe just stretch the wings or stretch the legs and we can see exactly how big they are and You can see that membrane just cleaning the eye there It's what they call a, a nictitating membrane And just wiping off anything off the sort of the ball of the eye there and Then also it helps them to protect their eyes especially when walking through grass and things like that just an extra protective film, if you will, over the eye. Shame, I think they are battling in this heat, much like we are. But yeah, I've got to really think about them because they're totally exposed there. They're definitely adapted for it and they, they seem fine. So thank goodness there is a quite a nice breeze that's picked up now and it's getting stronger as the, the time passes. Definitely getting a lot more comfortable than what it was just 20, 30 minutes ago. Lola, hello, afternoon to you. That's actually a very good question. Um, let me find out for you. I don't think it's going to be too long after these ones become independent of the adults. I don't think too long. Maybe in a few more months, but let me just find out a little bit more information on that and then I'll try and get back to you, Lola. But it's a very interesting question that. 
As you know, some birds do breed annually, which means that they'll breed once every year or so, but there's many species of birds out there that will do several clutches within the season. I'm presuming secretary birds are one of those, but we'll, we'll just follow up on that. Okay, so while we're watching these secretary birds, I think it'll be quite appropriate to bring up that on the 3rd of December is birding big day. And so the naturalists and camera ops um, are teaming up to partake in the biggest birding event of the year in South Africa. So very much a nice thing to get involved with. And pretty much we will all each have a team in the different locations um, and with a special ornithologist guest joining us on each of the drives. And uh, there'll also be a fireside chat on the 3rd of December at 8 p.m. And that's going to be in the Central African time to follow up on that. So definitely you can get involved with the big birding day. And I think the, the secretary birds would make a big or a good mascot for that. Because uh, we have been following up on them over the last few weeks. And yeah, definitely a, a nice mascot for that event. In my opinion, at least. It's actually amazing how well concealed they are. They're, they're quite big now, it looks like it. But yet you don't see much of them. And unless you drive all the way to the far eastern side of where this nesting site is, you're not going to really see them. And you won't know that they're in there. This is the, the best sort of view that we have on this eastern side. There you can see. Not a very big bush. So typically they do like the, the smaller sort of thorn bushes, just like that. That's a classic example for a nesting site for secretary birds not too not too far off the ground I'm so happy the secretary birds are growing fast and doing well. Thank you for the update, Andrew. It's nice to have you back. That's my best friend, y'all. Hey, Andrew. Hi. Called Alfred for the win. <laughs> okay, so we're doing a little bit of a loop. We've just done Treehouse Dam, Elephant Carcass to Twin Dams Road. We want to check Chelapan because it's hot. There might be something mud wallowing. And we're looking for elephants, buffaloes, leopards. So we figured this is a good place to check. The Mulawati, Chelapan, Pangolin track, and then back down Weaver's Nest, we're going to go towards Twin Dams. Hopefully we are lucky in this section. Well, it seems like Tess is having a bit of a struggle, so you guys are with us again. Not much has changed here as we thought would be the case. Um, it's uh, very, very, very still on the wild dog front. No one really kind of moving around too much at this stage. That actually reminds me, earlier we were talking about hunting. We were talking about success rates of wild dogs when they're hunting and how it works. And like I was saying, if you read books, you have a thing where it will tell you 70% of the time wild dogs are successful when they hunt and want to kill. Now that is not exactly true. Um, they, in a hunting session, will unfortunately kill 70% of the time, and I say unfortunately for the poor animals that they chase. But that is a hunting session. Wild dogs are unlike um, unlike, sorry, I'm just trying to the guide talking to me at the same time. It's quite difficult to talk to you guys and a guide at the same time. <laughs> um, so we'll <laughs> try and get through this shortly now. It's not always easy out here, but we try our very, very best.
Right, so we're talking about hunting with wild dogs and we were discussing 70% success rates about in books and those kinds of things. Right, but like I was saying, that refers to hunting sessions and so wild dogs, when they hunt, are animals that will chase multiple things. Uh, if you look at the other day, two days ago, when Ben had the wild dogs on quarantine, they chased impalas, um, they chased a steenbok, and multiple impalas at that. And so, yes, they caught something by the end of the hunting session, and so that, therefore, is a successful hunting session. But if you compare that to cats, so leopard, lion, um, cheetah, typically what happens with them is that they will stalk, see a prey animal, chase it and if they miss the hunt is over right so their hunting session is done because they are spotted they then alarm called out and everybody moves away and they're either unsuccessful or successful depends on what goes on so if you had to take the same sort of logic and apply it to wild dogs wild dogs will have anywhere between a 10 and 15 percent success rate which is lower than the cats um, and that is because if each individual chases an impala let's say in this pack there's eight adults and they chase eight impalas and they catch one you can already see where this kind of goes um, not every single animal that a wild dog or 70 percent of the animals that they chase are actually caught by them they chase many 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 different things but in the entirety of that hunting session and the amount of animals that they chase that's where the success rate comes in um, so yes they're successful at being determined to keep going and to have the stamina to keep going um, but they are not um, as successful as textbooks portray it, where they kind of portray these guys as that they will kill everything all the time. It's not like that. Um, dogs miss many, 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 many different animals, um, and they are just as capable of, of missing as any of the cats are. Uh, so it's a bit of a misnomer, that whole story. That's not to say, though, that they're not incredibly efficient when they do get it right. Um, I was talking the other day about you know the, this Toulon pack. This Toulon pack is an insane thing. So it's it's the biggest pack in this Kruger at the moment. Um, Forty three dogs. We are being seen together at the, I think they were seen last week at Sabi Sabi and Lion Sands. Um, and that pack, you know, with that many dogs, they're going to have to go through a, a lot of animals every single day. So they're going to be hunting regularly, um, and they will easily in a session kill multiple. Um, animals and I remember there was a pack that we used to see here back in 2011 2012 they used to come out of Kruger and then they would come on to Nkoro, Chitwa, um, Hoffmans and they used to hunt and um, they that pack was 32 if I'm not mistaken at the time and they the one morning killed seven adult impalas and a wildebeest young wildebeest it wasn't a fully grown one but it was not small either so that gives you an idea of how many things they can kill in a morning and eat yellow duck you're asking if wild dogs will i think you said hunt um dogs from other packs i think that's what i got from that question i don't know if it was hunt or interact i didn't quite pick that up um but hunt okay so hunt is not really the right word um there is um there is competition amongst packs of dogs and there will be altercations that take place that can result in death um, but it's not an active hunt as in there's food i'm going to chase it kill it and eat it most of the time with wild dogs when they interact much like with leopard or um, lions there is a fight that ensues kill happens and then they just leave that animal and off they go. So there was quite a big pack warfare. I'm trying to think it was last year or the year before. You know, these, these COVID years have gone by pretty quickly and I always forget when. But in the western sector of the Sabi Sands, the, the Sands pack um, and the Investec pack had a major story there where they killed, there was multiple dogs that were killed um, by other dogs so yes they can go after one another but it's not as a hunt it's not like they're like oh there's food and another wild dog i'm going to eat it you must also remember that some of the dogs um will need to kind of come up close to one another sniff each other and only then if they realize hang on a second this doesn't smell like my pack then there will be aggression that will ensue or they'll try and just run away from each other um, it's why when when packs are bonded they there is a very 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 important thing that you do which is to try and rub them on each other so you take it it looks really bad and from somebody from the outside if they had to see it and didn't know what was going on would think that you are 
doing all kinds of bad things to a wild dog and it, it feels quite wrong at the time um, and I mean this in the the most sincere way but um, basically you pick up the dog by its collar of its of its fur on its neck and by its back and then you go to the other dog and you almost like washboard it across the the other dog as though you kind of you know like I say washing something by hand so you rub it all over then you take its face and you rub it on the genitals of the dog that's the other dog and vice versa um, and then you take fecal matter which you have to extract using your finger which is not exactly amazing and so these are the, the glamorous parts of wild dog research that no one talks about and you have to then get fecal matter from obviously where it comes from and then rub that around the face and the nose of the other wild dog and so when they wake up they then know that they bonded um, and are together anyway <laughs> it's quite a gross thing to talk about so let's rather send you to an animal with Chris mm, very inquisitive elephant he's now trying to intimidate us but he's not gonna intimidate me Best is just to stand still. Nothing shakes the cat man. No, no, black mambas do. Black mambas do. <laughs> no, these young bulls do this often. They, you know, they're just growing up. They just want to flex a muscle. Just want to show that, hey, I'm a big growing elephant. And you yeah, just don't react to it. You know, just, it's a, obviously through experience. You know that he's just bluffing, and it's not even serious. It's more like, like, hey, I'm just gonna let you know I'm here, type of thing. And then they'll continue doing what they're doing. All the other signs that you look for when they act aggressive for real, and you obviously need to act differently then. But no, these young bulls often, often do that. Now slowly moving off. I was just watching him now. How he selects all the green bits. Right. Our elephant's pretty much gone. Oh, that was delightful. I must say it was quite a lovely sighting. So let's go over to Andrew now at Amakala to see what's in that part of the world. Okay, we are still watching them and there's still very little movement from them, I think, shame. They are sort of feeling the heat now, getting a bit of heat exhaustion, if you will. And they're just uh, conserving as much of their energy just by trying to sort of shelter from that heat. And try and keep as cool as possible, just like what we are doing. So Lola, just to answer your question about uh, when the secretary birds are likely to breed again and lay eggs. So I have chatted to someone. So as far as we understand it, um, it should be next year. Not sure if it's going to be exactly the same time next year, but uh, they do breed annually. So their sole focus for this year is these chicks until they grow up and then become independent. And then next year, um, it'll, it'll all start all over again. And it was quite interesting because I was having a chat to Wesley and uh, he was just saying to me that it's, we must just uh, obviously try and, and watch these chicks fledge when they do fledge out the nest and to see how many actually do fledge because he says that uh, the success rate is not, not the highest with secretary birds. So although that we are aware that there are three or at least two now and could be that the third one's still in there, it's doubtful whether all three of them are going to fledge. Um, usually one might get outcompeted. And most of the time they're only managing to fledge one chick but you never know with food availability and circumstances it's always possible that they could um, all fledge so I was just remembering a case in the the Kariha River uh, when I used to guide sort of just on the neighboring property of Kariha Game Reserve and uh, there were some nesting fish eagles for that year and we watched them and uh, as we know that a lot of the raptors do practice a siblicide but on this particular year 
both of the fish eel chicks were raised, which uh, is very uncommon. So it definitely has to do with availability and competition. Those are the main factors that's going to determine how successful this, uh, this little clutch and how far they're going to fledge. But so far doing all right, we've only done a roll call on two of them. But on previous days we have seen that there is a third one that might be a little bit deeper down. Or maybe just a little bit more shyer. And we'll just keep tabs to see if the third one is all right. Look at them, look at that face, very raptor-like. Marcy, good afternoon, thanks for that question. So Marcy, what will happen is the adults actually go to a water hole, drink water, and uh, they'll return back to this nesting site. And they literally dribble that water into the chicks' mouths until such time as they can fledge and then go to the water themselves. But yeah, we actually saw that, uh, was it two or three days before I went on my holiday? We saw them dribbling some water in their mouths, which is quite nice. Yeah, I would like to see that again. But every now and then when we look at these secretary birds, we see a feather or two sort of fl uh, flying around in the wind. So I'm just wondering how, f how many or how much feathers um, they do have. And I do see a little bit of feathers there. So it looks like the, the plumage is growing quite well. Beautiful, beautiful thing to do. Just come up here, see how the secretary birds are doing. Yeah, and no, I've never, never really been exposed to secretary bird nests before. And uh, this is a whole new thing for me. And uh, very much a privilege. In the 12 days I was away, I really missed them. I'm glad to be back. There we go, just a little bit of movement there. If you look at that face, it's very much almost like an eagle's face. And the way the books describe them is to be sort of hawk-like, and then they sort of walk like, uh, like uh, storks do. So that's the way the, the, the books describe them. Walk like a stork, but look like an eagle. And so the one adult has been away for quite some time now since we've been here. So hopefully, you never know, maybe returns back here with a little bit of food. Maybe we see a snake or a mouse again. I would think uh, the adult probably would have come back by now, judging by how many mouths are there to be fed. But you never know. I was just saying to Morgan just now, I wonder how much they've already eaten today. How many snakes and mice they've already had. Shame the one is fast asleep but slowly waking up. The one on the left side. Just a little bit of head movements. And then keeping a sharp eye for the adults. When the adults do arrive because when the adults do arrive with food they're going to need to fight over it to, to be the first one to gobble it down and that's going to aid them in their own survival so it's What is your role at Eco Trading? Mm. Tell us more. I'm very excited to actually be talking on a more personal level. Two, one, live, live. Some early information before it kind of hits the wire. General banter, you know, just connecting.
I wish that you were here to feel how the breeze has picked up. It is beautiful. The Egyptian geese are taking advantage, having a little drink. They've just come out of the shadows because that breeze is going to keep them nice and cool. And they are looking absolutely relaxed as though there are definitely no leopards around, which is fantastic for the Egyptian geese. It's just really not as fantastic for myself and Impor because we want to see some spots. But I have a challenge for you. Based on this view and this view alone, Impor is not going to go wide and show you. I want you to guess where we are. Do you think you know where we are? Let me know. I'm excited to hear. <laughs> I suppose there are limited guesses available or options available, but that white looking soil should give you an idea. I can't wait to hear it. Now this is one of the few pairs of Egyptian geese. That doesn't have chicks. Ooh, Tristan's dogs are on the move. Let's go have a look. Well, the dogs are hunting impalas. The impalas came and they've hunted them. Well, starting to hunt them and they've run into Arethusa, so we're going to lose them now. Um, unfortunately, I was hoping the and impalas were going to run our side, but it's not what's happened, I'm afraid. Um, the impalas have gone into Arethusa, and so really some of the pack has gone that way. I'm hoping the rest. Well, they miss and they come back. Looks like they're coming back, which is good news. So luckily we don't have to worry. Yeah, here they come. Oh, okay, well, we'll just stop here then. All this activity for not very much. Now let's get a proper count of how many we've got. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven dogs that I can see. Pretty cool that they're up and moving already. It's much, much, much earlier than I thought. What did I say? Did I say hoppers five? It's only five past five now. So they're moving a lot earlier than I thought they would. Um, normally dogs like to to move a little <laughs> bit later than this, but I suppose if they've been lying all day and there's a cool breeze blowing, then maybe why not? Um, and it's always like this with dogs. You'll find one gets up and starts to kind of make a bit of a noise and that triggers everybody and then the impalas just happen to be close by and obviously that's why everybody shot off to try and uh, catch up with them. But luckily they didn't go into Arthur's I was almost certain that we were going to lose them with the impalas going that way. Oh well, it's going to be a big... And this is not really ideal, if I'm honest with you. Where they were lying earlier was much better. This is a bit of a problem. Um, this is the main road for this area. And so there are cars that are constantly going up and down, up and down. And now that they're lying in the middle, people are going to want to try and push past them, which is going to make them want to get up. So it would have been better if they just lay off the road slightly. Um, but the fact that they're now lying across the road <laughs> means it's going to be a tough one. Sorry guys, that's just the radio. It is thrilling being with wild dogs. Wild dogs are chaos animals. There's always just something going on with them. Um, and so, you know, that's why spending time with them is worth it. Um, you know, a lot of people often think, oh, but it's just dogs and it's, you know, it's like nothing that they haven't seen before and can't be that dissimilar from a dog at home, but they are amazing animals. And from a action point of view, there's nothing out here that provides the same amount of frenzied activity as wild dogs. They just go and go and go and go and go. Um, and there's always something that goes on with dogs, whether they chasing animals all over the place, they treeing leopards, they're interacting with hyenas, they always doing something and so they have a, a really really busy life and that makes them highly entertaining for us as people you know we're able to spend a lot of time with them yeah go ahead yeah you're gonna have no choice they're all over the road so there's going to be a whole bunch of cars unfortunately that are going to come past which is really not ideal um, I'm hoping that they'll all start to kind of settle and then we'll have some semblance of movement that's going to take place. Um, but yeah, there's 
going to be a bit of a mess this, I'm afraid. Dogs, can we not just lie off the road slightly just to let all the traffic pass? We do have a wild dog roadblock. This is the Savi Sand style roadblock. <laughs> it's not exactly ideal if you're in a small car. If you obviously if you're in game viewers or four by fours, then it's easy to just go around them here. Although this uh, this area it always looks like a lot of people don't notice it, but it's always innocuous. This little kind of fire break section that goes off to the left. And people are always just off-road there without thinking. But what's hidden in here that a lot of people don't pick up is zebra wood. This little section here has got quite a few zebra woods on it. And they are lethal for tyres. Um, if you drive over zebra wood, you're going to have a lovely flat tyre. Um, and I've seen countless guys go off-road here and end up with flats. Um, so, you know, smaller cars not going to survive going through that. The only problem with these dogs is that they have lay in the shade and we are now stuck in the sun which is super hot so i think i'm going to try and reposition quickly and see if we can't get a bit of shade in the meantime though let's send you from sleeping dogs to sleeping cats okay we've managed to find our little boy so objective number two Alright, he's still hiding. I only see the back of his head now. And he's looking alright. He's that stood up now and he's got a slight lump on the one leg. Not bad though. Just want to try and see if there's not perhaps a way to get around him to get to the other side. Yeah. I'll just watch him for a little bit. And if he doesn't, he's probably gonna fall back to sleep. But this sleepy time for lion still. He hasn't really moved much since this morning. In fact, almost the exact same spot where he was. He's grooming himself, which could be an indication that he might start moving. We don't know. Well, we'll, we'll sit here and watch him and and see what he does. Rashawn, hello, is asking if captive lions are released back into the wild, will they survive? Yo, that's a, that's a, normally these things are notoriously difficult. I know of captive bred lions that were introduced into new reserves uh, but I cannot say whether they are self-sustaining and they are able to fend for themselves. Remember, they are supposed to be pride animals. So if you take a solitary lion into the, you know, it's it's not part of a pride. So if you have a few lions that have grown up together as, if I can say, a pride, I suppose if there's a good prey density, they might just... But the thing is, they would have been so far, you know, they, they won't understand all the dangers and stuff. You know, although instinct is strong, I'm sure it's possible. Um, and I'm sure I'd love to know more if there's any successful attempts at this. But I know, generally speaking, it's almost, almost a no-go to try and do that. Unless you keep feeding them. Um, I know of successful attempts on cheetah. Confirmed ones. But uh, I'm, when saying I'm not aware of any lion successful introductions from captive populations, it's just because I'm not, I've not seen it. 
but I'm sure somewhere it must have happened. I, I, I personally think it, it's doable, but whether you'll ever successfully integrate them into a society of other lines is a question that remains. Definitely it won't happen in Kruger. There's no need to reintroduce any more lions here. Because the Kruger region is saturated with the lion population. So there's no need to increase the number of lions in the area. In fact, we had a short discussion about this a couple of days ago. About ecological carrying capacity. So the lions in Kruger is a population that has reached and they maintain the ecological carrying capacity. So there's no need to reintroduce lions into the Greater Kruger. Because they filled all the available space available to them, in theory. Still with our dogs, some of them have just started to stand up a little bit and they kind of greeting one another and there's a little bit of interaction taking place. It's nothing crazy at this stage, um, but there's a little bit of grooming, a little bit of interacting. Everybody's kind of doing their thing as wild dogs do. Um, the two puppies are playing more than probably anybody else, uh, but that's to be expected. We should always expect puppies to have a good time. Um, they are, of course, more youthful and so playing is important. Unfortunately, that car is just positioned in a way that's a bit tricky for us. Um, there's a lot of little movements and things that are taking place. I'm hoping what's going to happen though is that they're going to lie down eventually and take it easy. Um, that they're going to decide to sort of sit here for a bit and then eventually start sort of running into Juma itself. I'll be very sad if they run <laughs> into Arethusa because I think it's going to be fun to follow these guys. Unfortunately though we don't really have a huge amount of space to work with here because we've got um, Juma on the one side and then we've got Arethusa on the other side and then south of us which is not very far in the direction that they're heading is Hoffman's. So we're right in the corner which could easily mean that we're going to get ourselves into a situation where we're not going to be able to follow them for very long when they start hunting. So that's why I'm hoping that they're going to cut eastwards and go straight into the, to the well, into the Juma and then start hunting along Fulamon's cut line, Treehouse Dam, try and push maybe an impala into one of the water holes. It's always interesting to watch, although a lot of you might not want to see that. Um, wild dogs fermenting impalas is never a great situation but are very very cool to see them all here and kind of milling about so early in the afternoon with beautiful light on them so let's hope that we can stay with them for a while We've got a really well hidden Woodlands Kingfish. <laughs> it found the one little branch to hide behind. But you can see the blue really nicely. It looks like that sapphire neon y blue that we could see in the sky behind the bataliers earlier. And we're hoping, because there's been another one calling, so this one's kind of just hopped around. We're hoping it's going to hop closer in front of that log or that branch so you can see the whole bird but this is actually a really unique view it's really different because it's almost like it segments the bird into three distinct parts that are all incredibly useful so maybe that's a good way to look at it a really bright little piece of tail sticking out on the left so 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 important for steering when flying 
So this kingfisher, being a bird that will hawk on branches like it is now, if it sees an insect, it'll come down and scoop it up, but it needs to be able to make very quick changes in direction to do that. So that tail on the left-hand side is super important. The really big bulky part in the middle with the streak of black through it, very unique and different marking. Obviously, this is all of the other bits of the bird that are really important. Some really well adapted lungs, all important wings, very well developed breast muscles and chest muscles. All of those vital organs. And now it looks like a headless, headless wooden kingfisher. There comes the beak. Please turn your beak a little bit more, birdie. Oh, the light is playing tricks on us in the clouds. I really wanted to turn its head back this way so you can see how pronounced that beak is. There we go. You can see part of it. It's still at a bit of an angle. Very good eyesight, this little bird. And then a super pronounced specialized beak that is bright red. That should help us understand a little bit more about its behavior. So you can normally tell quite a lot, there we go, about a bird and its diet in particular just by the shape of the beak. Now the kingfishers are specialized for picking up small prey at speed that moves really quickly. So whether it's the pied kingfisher that actually looks for fish mostly or whether it's the woodland kingfisher like this one that catches mostly insects it needs to have a decent beak that can catch something that might be right next to its face or a little bit further away. It needs to have a robust beak that can withstand a bit of impact. And it must definitely have enough force to hold. Yay, there's some answers for where we are. That's exciting. Linmar, you think we are at Gari Dam? It's a very, very decent guess. I love it. We are at a dam, and I understand why you chose Gari Dam, because there's a very white washed away section close to the dam wall. So thank you for the answer. We are in fact not at Gari Dam though. <laughs> there's a beautiful drainage line behind this kingfisher. Honey badger on the money. We are at Twin Dams. We've been hoping to do some really impressive birding here, hoping to find a leopard, maybe some hyenas, but alas, the birds are hiding. They're here, they're just not being overly cooperative. <sighs> but you can see the Mulawati drainage line there behind the kingfisher. This is that massive jackalberry tree that overhangs. Elaine, you thought it might have been Treehouse Dam, also a really good guess. All three, oh hi, all three with Egyptian geese, all three with white sandy beaches. But alas, twin dams it is. So that's the jackalberry tree where I had that epic sighting of Langa on this bottom branch with Khat. She was on this bottom branch here overhanging the Mulawati, which is down there. Isn't this amazing? Our beautiful big jackalberry tree. And off to the right, where the Egyptian geese were before Tristan's wild dog started getting very mobile is Twin Dams. Ta-da! Well done, honey badger, for getting that right. <laughs> Twin Dams looks exceptionally green recently. All of this rain is certainly stirring up those microbes and <clears throat> algal blooms. But it looks beautiful today, doesn't it? Nice and calm. A little bit of cloud cover building up. This is still quite mild compared to the horizon. The horizon looks a little bit angry <laughs> on the other side. But yes, this is absolutely beautiful and one of my favorite spots. I think up here on the bank looking down over the Mulawati with twin dams, with everything that's around it, it's just such an exceptional spot for birding, for predators, for elephants. So whether it's a small animal or a large animal, there's a decent chance you'll find it here at Twin Dams. 
I mean, up to the left here where those tall trees are, that is where I found. We've had Langa, Shasha, Maribs, Tandi, Tlalamba, Molwati. I mean, so many different leopards that we've seen here just in the last little while, the last few months to a year. At the dam itself, we often have those big buffalo herds. I wish I was counting buffaloes like Chris has been. Elephant herds. So many reptiles, right? Terrapins, a lot of little skinks. We've had snakes here, we've had chameleons here, and of course, monitor lizards. A wealth of bird life. You can hear them calling now. Have a listen. Big and small. <clears throat> and of course, so many insects and scorpions. It's just such a good place to be. Look at how green it's getting. All of the grass surrounding is growing. It's getting greener by the day. Now these trees in particular, this is where we've had hornbills nesting, we've had woodland kingfishers nesting, green woodhoopers nesting, bennets, bennets woodpeckers as well. And those trees over there overlooking Mulawati, or overhanging the Mulawati, it's just such an exceptional spot. But also plenty <laughs> it's a woodland kingfisher alarming. That's interesting. We're going to go down into the Malawati to investigate because there are so many amazing hiding spots here. And it sounds like Kevin has something very big that is trying to hide. Yes, we've with a breeding herd of and they are in the thickets there, but we're going to try and give you the Now they'll move in and out a bit. It looks like a mixed herd. In other words, it's, uh, it's cows in there, calves, some bulls. I'm going to go a bit forward, BK. I think we've got a visual up ahead here. Let me bear with, bear with me, guys. Up, oh, damn it. Oh, no, Dave, they go. I don't think so. Yes, no, yes, no. Well, there's a very interesting phenomenon happening with these dogs. Good news is they've cut east into Juma, just like we asked them to do. And I'm pretty sure we're going to get a hair raising chase at some point. So they're moving through a block where there's lots of diker. And if they see one, they're going to be on it immediately. But what they're doing is those ones that you saw there, they were um, eating a millipede. Now, it's a thing that only wild dogs do out of the big cats and big predators. I haven't seen hyenas do it. I haven't seen leopard or lion do it. Um, it's just these guys and what they do is they bite it and crunch it and then they roll in it um, and I don't know if it's maybe because of the the chemicals that are within millipedes or the smell that they use it for no one I've asked can explain to me why they do it um, none of the the researchers um, but it's to do with the, the cyanide traces that are found in uh, millipedes my theory has always been is that it helps with maybe tick prevention i don't know it's an interesting thing though but they always do it at this time of the year when there's lots of millipedes all right let's catch up with them because like i say what they're doing is they're quite fanned so they're all running in different spots and basically what they're trying to flush is diker scrub hair uh, steenbok impala those are the target species when they are moving like this uh, they try and kind of go to each bush and you see how they like sniff around each bush and when a scrub here sees them it bolts then they go after it and it's the same with like I say all the the antelope species as well and so when they're in blocks like this you know that at some point one of them is going to spot something and go uh, it's going to only be a matter of time they're also not very far from our boundary so if they do go they are going to be gone very quickly I'm afraid um, Nicholas, yes, this is typical for wild dogs. There's nothing unusual about today's adventure so far. Um, wild dogs always give you the run around. Oh, I just drove past Termite Mound where I had Tingana, one of my last like, really epic sightings of him. 
was on this mound here. Um, like he just sat there, it was the most beautiful light. Missed that cat, but anyway, it is how it goes. Unfortunately, none of them can last forever. Um, as you'll see the dogs, much like what you find with leopards and lions, is that they defecate on the roads. Um, they often do it. You see these ones, I'm sure I found another millipede. Sorry, let me roll forward because there's a bush in the way here. Oof, and that poo stinks. See if they grab it. You might hear them crunching it if they do find one. There you go, you hear it? They're actually eating them today, which is quite cool. I do have seen them eat them too. Normally they just crunch it and then roll it. But they're actually eating them today. Crazy. And there's nothing else out here, like I say, mammal-wise, that I've seen eating them besides civets. Um, so I don't know what it is about millipedes that makes civets so happy. But clearly something about them. But you can see how they're scanning. Every time they run, they trot, they listen, look, and then it's time to go again. Sonia, so quite similar speeds um, to leopard and lion, and the, the dogs, but for a much, 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 much longer period of time. Leopards and lions can only sustain that for very short bursts, um, whereas dogs can do it for, for a long time. All right, little puppy, off you go. It's a beautiful puppy, this one, that's on my right side here. Uh, it's got, like... Its bottom half looks like it's been dipped in black and the top half is mostly caramel. It's a very, very pretty little animal. That's all right, let's catch up and just got in mind the landmine that is here. Do not want that in our tires, because that is like molten tar that is going to be in the tires and then it's flings up everywhere and it goes on you and it's just not a fun time. No one likes wild dog poo on them. And like I say, when you bond them, you have to extract it manually from their behind and it's not a fun experience. Obviously you use a glove because otherwise you're just going to hate every second of your life after that and plus highly dangerous to be doing that. Their fecal matter has all kinds of horrible things in it. Um, so not something you want to play around with too much. Now they're cutting through the block to off-road through this block is going to be silly. Um, I know we're probably running a risk of maybe not keeping up with them or finding them, um, but I'm almost certain they come and come out on Philemon's uh, cut line with Zoe's. And if they do, there's often impalas there, so I want to be there when they do come out uh, in case they spot impalas and go after them. They should be fairly close to us now already. No man, Rusty. Okay, let's just check here quickly. I want to see. Yeah, you see, there are impalas here. Exactly what I thought. I'm almost certain they're going to come at these guys. has just bolted off there's some here so what we're gonna do like I say it's a bit of a gamble in this um, so what I'm hoping I'm gonna get is the dogs coming and the impalas watching them so we're gonna try and position so that we can get a two shot of them that's always the way that you want to do things so here we go and the dogs should hopefully come straight from behind the impalas now. This is the direction that they would travel um, if they do come and these impala rams would be what they would chase obviously. Now the impalas are going to move off. Really impala? We had it all planned. Impalas are not doing what they're supposed to. Naughty dogs did what they're supposed to, impalas are not would have been, like I say, such a perfect angle because they would have just come straight through that clearing at us. But anyway, sometimes the most well-planned shots don't go the way you want them to. And so 
unfortunately for us, we're now just going to have to wait for the dogs to appear. <laughs> the problem with this is, is that if a diker decides to run between here and there, and it goes the opposite direction, the dogs can go the opposite direction too, um, and we can lose them. So it's a bit of a gamble that we're playing like this, but I'm almost certain that they're going to come out this way. Um, I'm pretty sure that this is the direction that they will want to head. Um, it amazes me though because these dogs, I mean we don't know them and they don't really know this area but yet they're moving. There they are, there. I can see them just in front here. So they stray through this thicket but quite far in, moving from left to right by the looks of things. I saw one at least. See them straight behind that bush there. Veronica, you should, because once it gets going, as we know, it's going to be chaos. The problem is where the wild dogs are and where the impalas are is not ideal. The block where the impalas are at the moment is Ardfark Heaven, um, and there are holes there that are the size of this Land Rover, so you have to be so careful. There we go. There goes the impalas, and here comes the dogs. Straight at us. But I don't think they're going to hunt them. I think they're looking for lambs. See, they watch these males. And they're like, nope, don't want those, we want lambs. So they're going to maybe then run along Philemon's, hopefully, rather than come um, south. Because behind us here is Gauri Main. So if they go there, then we unfortunately won't be able to follow them any further. But if they run up Philemon's, then that's really good news for us. Because that means then they're going to maybe head towards um, quarantine. Um, that's, and that will be good. Because we know there's lots of Impala up that way that they can potentially go after. Beautiful light on them though, isn't it, in this green grass. They're such pretty animals. I don't know why people don't find wild dogs beautiful. I think they're amazing. I like their colorations and the patterns that they have. Um, and the fact that each one... Uh, Woody, the biggest prey I've personally seen wild dogs get is buffalo. Which is obviously a very, very large uh, animal. But... Um, and that's photographic and video evidence and I've seen them go after but not kill one but I've seen footage and photos of them killing buffalo um, so but personally in the flesh uh, male kudu and male wildebeest are the two biggest that I've seen them take um, which are big and even things like lions struggle with those kinds of things so it's a, a pretty crazy um, crazy ability that they've got now like I say what I'm hoping is they're just going to stay on the cut line and keep going Philemon's takes us all the way along back towards the quarantine area um, and that's going to be really good hunting grounds and given that they had success there uh, a few nights ago they all know full well that this area or that area has potential prey animals and so hopefully that's going to take them now up into that direction uh, that's exactly what we want is them to head that way if we want sort of any sort of hunt um, but if they turn towards treehouse I don't think they'll find as much in the way of prey yeah well at this time of the year the lambs are much easier to hunt than the adults um, there's less stamina in a lamb and lambs uh, often make mistakes and there's lots of them so normally if they find a group of lambs it's a nursery and so their chances of getting multiple is increased um, Older male impalas like that are wise to wild dogs and what wild dogs get up to. And so they're not going to want to chase those because that's a lot more effort. And they know that big kills means that it attracts the attention of leopard, like you saw the other day, um, or lions or hyenas. Whereas little lambs, they can eat the little lambs pretty quickly without having to worry too much about... Um, bigger predators coming in and stealing from them so it's part of the reason why I think they're targeting smaller things lambs are just easier to hunt at the moment um, a lot less risk involved no horns so a lot of a lot of factors that lend themselves to to hunting lambs instead of uh, adults all right let's keep up with them see where they go but they're heading the right direction these dogs listen nicely unlike Clolumba. Although Clolumba, the last time I was with her, she was so good, she kind of said, Lola, she must go there, and then she did. So she's been doing well for us. Let's go 
sounds. There's obviously other cars that have joined us now. Dogs on the move always brings everybody else in. Um, so we'll just pull off for them to let them come past. Metabolic rate and again why they have to hunt so much. Sorry, little button quail. Little button quail. Nice driving. Alright, so we're getting to the right place now because from here to quarantine is easy. They just cut straight where there's that termite mound in front. They just cut straight across and then they are in onto quarantine. Um, so it's uh, not far to where we would expect them to have some success hunting and for there to be pandemonium again. I know with Ben the other day, he said it was just they were chasing all kinds of things around. But you can see that it's definitely impala lambs that they're looking for. Or things like Dyka. Dyka is also a good thing for them. Nice and small. Easy to overpower. The problem with dogs is you can follow them like this and it, you know they're on the road, they're on the road, they're on the road and then all of a sudden they just go. So you know you can't predict when they're going to actually hunt and when it's actually going to happen. You just have to sit and try and wait and just let it happen when it happens really. Um, so you just got to kind of <laughs> follow until then. I'm so glad we had Rusty as well. But don't tell Rooster that. Or Tessa. Rusty is a great car for wild dog viewing. It has a very, very sporty, let's call it a sporty engine <laughs> when it needs to be. And so it often, you know, when you're in sort of following dogs and they need to go, you can keep up with them. I think in Rooster would be a lot harder. Rooster's also a much longer wheelbase, heavier car. And this is a much easier beast in many ways to handle and to maneuver. And dogs, sometimes you need maneuverability in order to keep up with them. Interested to see, no, no impalas here today. Often we get impalas along Philemon's here on the these open clearings on either side. Um, they like to come in and just take it easy on this clearing, but I don't see anything as yet. Nah, nothing here. I'm almost certain these guys are gonna go straight to quarantine. I think because they had success there the other night, they know where that is, they know that clearing, and they're gonna head back in that direction to go and hunt. I just hope that they don't cut through the block. I, was, I want them to go straight on the road and then cut up um, towards Philemon's dip because um, if they come through this block it's going to be uh, you won't keep up with them there's a big drainage here and it's tricky enough to follow leopard through there let alone wild dogs so what we need for them is to go straight although they cut it one's cutting south and one's cut north and one's going dead straight All right. Well, we'll keep up with the dogs for as long as we can, and hopefully at some point, like I said, they'll find themselves a meal. In the meantime, though, let's send you across to Kevin, who's got some zebra and wildebeest. From action over there in Juma, you join a deck where where we are looking at a very tranquil scene of the fold with zebra and wildebeest. And as BK is scanning for you, you can see just how many there, there are out here all over. One or two folds in between there as well. Beautiful scenes. Are oh, you getting frisky, my boy? <laughs> Especially with those yellow flowers in between.
just seem to be that there's a little bit of thunder clouds building up there and there. <laughs> it looks as if we are the love boat captains. We've uh, captured a few uh, intimate moments over the past few days. <laughs> Look at this little one. Yin and yang. We are letting you enjoy the scene. Lily, thank you. It is, you know, Madikwe is what you can class as arid savanna. Some of it are Kalahari. Bush Kalari felt as we call it, and when the rains come, it really transforms the landscape from very dry and barren during the, the dry season, our winter, which is May, June, July, August, September. And then all of a sudden after these first rains, it just explodes and it's all these vivid colors. And in my personal experience, I also think Madikwe has got the nicest light. Especially this time of the day, very soft golden light. And that is why the zebra are popping so nicely against, against that background. Now this will comprise of quite a few herds here. This is not one big herd of zebra. You'll have these clans in between. Little harems all over the show. I think if I were have to guess, it's probably three different, different groups, different harems of, of zebra here. Those ones in the back and then on the left. Okay, Laura, I'm going to ask BK to go back for you to that zebra fell. Now, Laura, have a look. Exactly there we stand. You see his legs, it's almost the same length as the mother's legs. You see that? So they are born in a very advanced state. That gestation period, Laura, is 375 days, which is long. So when that little foal comes, in an hour or so, it is ready to go. And that is its main defense, being very mobile. Look at those long legs for such a small body. So they can really, really run fast. And that's its main line of defense. There's actually one lying down fast, a sleep beaker. You see on the left here, little foal. There's little one lying. On its side, out for the count, dead to the world, sleeping. Look there. <laughs> you often see them doing that. Mum is close by, feeding, producing those rich, that rich milk that that foal will be needing. And it hasn't got a care in the world. Look at that. Yes, we're talking about your baby. You see there's life? <laughs> almost as if that uh, zebra mare knew we were talk talking about a youngster there, yes. And then Laura, of course, just being within a herd, many eyes, many ears out here on the plains where they can see quite far, that in itself is a way of protection as well.
we're going to continue watch them for a short while longer and then we're going to move on and go and explore and see what else we can find for you this afternoon in Medikwe. Here at Wild Earth, we know it's not always possible to watch your favorite show live. If catching up on safaris is critical to you, then download the Wild Earth app and watch the catch-ups here first. Catch-ups are available on our app before YouTube, and in addition, there are cut-downs of each show for those who only have time to watch the best bits. That was incredibly cute. Download the brand new Wild Earth app today and don't miss out. I'm back in the area where the buffalo herd was. Apparently there's a newborn, like literally, literally newborn buffalo calf. I'm going to try and find them again. And see if we can't see a newborn buffalo calf. The interesting is, it's, they get born and within minutes, they're up and they go with the rest of the, the herd. They're designed like that, they can't stay behind. Buffalo cow on their own can be vulnerable to, to lions. <coughs> and um, so, and you can even see it in the way the calves drink. If you look at cattle, mom stands like that. Calves normally come from the side and very seldom from the back, usually from the side, but also domestic cows and this is coming from a cattle farmer myself um, that they often they very seldom drink when the cows are removed but buffalo they drink from the rear so the the teats are further back closer to the back part of the hind legs and that enables the calf to actually drink on the move interesting little adaptation that they have as opposed to domestic cattle um, it's not that domestic cattle can't do it, they're just less prone to do it. They should be in this block here. I'm probably going to emerge somewhere around here.
Niall, how do buffalo avoid contracting bovine, bovine diseases? Well, they don't do anything deliberately. It's actually the other way around. Buffaloes actually carry a lot of bovine diseases that don't always affect them, but it can infect and affect domestic cow. Bovine tuberculosis, corridor disease, brucellosis, to name a few. Um, a lot of those diseases seem to just stay dormant in the buffalo population and never gets to a symptomatic phase. So they are just maintenance vectors of these disease. Tuberculosis sometimes gets hold of them if they get immunocompromised. Maybe a lion's got hold of them, they're badly scratched. You know, they, uh, there's a bit of immunocompromising there and then they can contract TB. But anthrax is a different story. Anthrax kills quickly and spreads quickly. But we have occasional outbreaks of anthrax in the region. Disease natural to the area. Whereas bovine tuberculosis, foot and mouth, are also diseases that were introduced, both of them, into the area. But somehow the buffalo carries it, never symptomatic or very seldom. Another disease, foot and mouth, very important. Um, and it brings a bit of a problem, because the Kruger National Park area, including the associated private reserves surrounding it, where we are at the moment, um, is the largest herd of buffalo free natural occurring buffalo in South Africa all right so the rest of the country there's a lot of areas where buffalo are virtually extinct and a lot of new reserves are being erected and they want buffalo in order to complete their big five and reintroduce populations back into other areas the problem is we cannot move buffalo from within this what we call the red zone the greater Kruger area away out and relocate them because of those diseases and these are veterinarian law restrictions applying to that in order to protect the national uh, cattle production industry because I mean that's food We'll continue that conversation. It's not as just as simple as that. Right, let's go over to Tristan, who seemed to have caught up with his wild dogs again. Right, so the dogs are about to get onto quarantine. We're a few meters away now. It's like not even a hundred meters up the road here. So I just wanted to get you guys to us before we hit quarantine. Because once we go into quarantine, which I'm pretty sure is going to be a pretty fast um, experience. <laughs> it never takes long for these guys to get going once they get there. So what I'm actually going to try and do, depending on where they go, I want to actually try and maybe get past them um, and get to quarantine already so that we can get into position to film them. Or I suppose we can just stay behind them because they're just going to go racing off and from in front of us. Um, I'm trying to stay off the road because they're still couple behind me they were drinking in a little wallow at Philemon's dip and uh, so I just want the whole pack to catch up and not be on the road and they have to go around us to catch up with them uh, they can all just come and get onto where they need to be before such time as they actually make it to quarantine so quarantine is just on top of this hill here um, you can just see the marula trees on top coming and that's pretty much where I'm sure chaos is going to ensue So I believe there's impalas on the Juma Dam cam, just three of them. Um, I don't know, if they're not lambs, I don't think these guys are going to be that interested. I think they're looking for the nursery or a little creche of lambs. Um, I think that's what they're after. So I'm pretty certain as soon as we get onto quarantine, the nursery should be there at this time of the day. It's starting to get dark now. Um, makes sense that they will be almost um, onto the main sort of clearing. It's crazy how dogs go there. Now, aren't we lucky? They could have gone any direction and we would have had no chance with them and we would have unfortunately had to leave them, but they did so well for us by coming to where we think 
it's their best opportunity and where we can view them very, very nicely. All right, you lot. So we're on the edge of quarantine now. So what they might do is just pause. I can see impalas already from here um, on the clearing. So we might just pause a little bit just to see. And then they're going to go, as soon as they see anything, they'll start to run. Especially if they pick up lambs. If they see lambs, then they will be very quick in their ability to get through. I'm just going to go through a little bit, just past them, so I can see where the lambs are. And that will help with being able to figure out where they're going to go. I saw one impala far down there, but nothing here so far. There's a one impala ram. So let's see what's going to happen. We're looking for, like I say, lambs, not rams. It's like a little rhyme. Lambs, not rams. I can see where all the lambs are. They're far, far, far down. There's the females and the lambs all the way down by DRC side. Here go the dogs. Look, look, look. There they go. We'll try to keep up with them. It's going to be absolute pandemonium to try and keep up with these guys, but we'll do it. Still going. You can see they cover the whole of quarantine in the space of a few seconds. And so I haven't even lost them now, I don't even know where they've gone. I think some of them are on our right hand side and some went off to the left. Typical dogs hunting in a clearing. Which is why I wanted the chaos of them to... Uh, <laughs> they're gone already. <laughs> uh, classic. Now we just gotta wait for the dam cam to see... There they are, they are chasing an impala right here. Just gotta hold on everybody. still after it. There's a whole bunch of them chasing this one impala in front of us here. Now we just got to be a bit more careful on this section because there are a few little stumps. Still going. And the whole pack is chasing this one poor impala which is not going to have much fun of it given it's being chased by a whole bunch of dogs and also going into a horrible horrible place. just impossible to keep up with them even though we're driving much quicker than we normally would they've gone into this block so <laughs> now I've got to work out whether to follow them there or to wait for them here to see if they come around back this side I think let's just wait and listen because if they kill we'll hear them But as you can see, it's just complete chase and exhaust, chase and exhaust. So they're going to keep going until they kill. Now they might go all the way up this hill, round over the back, down towards Rebecca's, or they could kill in the block. But that's why I'm listening now. I don't hear anything. The reason I don't want to go far is because there's a crossing point here that we can get through if we need to. There we go. They've, we can hear them. They've made a kill, I'm sure. So they're inside the drainage here, which is not going to be easy to get to. We'll try and see. Let's watch here, Rian. But it is horrible in here. I haven't been in here for a long time. I'm trying to listen. I 
I know I can get through somewhere here. There's a way. Yeah, they're here, just in front of me. All right. Let's try and see. Try and get around this particular tree because we're not going to be able to push that one down. No, we're not going to do that. It's not going to help going that way. Let's try this way. I know there's a way through here. I did it once with Pasana, of course. Classic though that it would be in the inaccessible spot not on quarantine itself. Okay, so let's try from here. All right, so we're in the drainage now. Now we just gotta try to get to where they are. Um, in the meantime though, let's send you across to Chris. Right, we uh, found the buffalo now, it's just a matter of sitting here and uh, seeing if we can find that calf, that's the thing, it's going to be tricky, it's quite dense here. Anyway, so I'll have to go a bit forward. We'll edge forward a little bit and check. It's none of them visible here. The herd is spread out quite widely. Alternatively, that cow might still be approaching here. She might, try and, she might just be a little bit behind. If you know, we can't see it, we all. We have given it a try. It seems like some of them wants to lie down. There's a big old bull lying down. Nothing there. Wow! Right, we need to go back to Tristan, whose dogs might have caught something. Well, we managed to get in and find them. It's, it was tricky, but we got here in the end. Um, like I said, I know I've been through here before. It was just remembering the old path, and it's so overgrown compared to the last time I was in here. Um, just needed to figure out exactly which route to get to. Um, but yeah, they managed to kill that impala um, ewe that we saw them chasing. Um, it's not in a great spot for us to view much of it, but they're busy feeding. And you can hear there's not a crazy amount of fighting at this stage. And the reason for that is because it's quite a big kill and everyone's managed to get bits and pieces of it and take it to their own respective places and eat. But as it starts to condense and get smaller, um, the carcass will then, you'll start to see the dogs being far more, um, far more kind of vociferous with one another. Um, and there'll be a lot more tension between the pack when they eat. When they grab bigger things, often the, the amount of noise is much less. But it's very, very much how you find kills when you're following dogs is that you listen for the sound and then you're able to pick it up from there. So, epic though. How crazy was that chase? Um, so well worth <laughs> following them for a while. Um, but this meal is a good one, but it's not gonna be enough for the whole pack. So I wouldn't be surprised from here back up onto quarantine and start again. Um, the thing is with them is I don't want to move too much because there's other vehicles that are watching from on top. 
um, they can't get down here like we can and so if I move it's going to affect their view um, we're going to be in the line of their photographs so we'll just sit quietly the nice thing with dogs the kill free they'll end up coming back towards where we are with it but isn't it insane how much stamina these animals have I mean you think about where we drove and the speed that we drove at and we couldn't keep up with them all the way across quarantine and all the way back now I've been doing walking and running on quarantine the last few days so basically the loop that they just did um, is about a one kilometer loop around obviously they did a bit more straight line but at that speed is unbelievable it's a crazy 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 speed to be doing um, Luckily, in quarantine, it's fairly safe for us to drive like that. You can't drive like that in these thickets. You'll never make it. Um, but it's impressive to watch these guys and the efficiency and the sheer endurance that they have um, when they get going. You'll hear the squeaking and carrying on. That's when they start fighting over bits of meat. And this should theoretically attract hyenas. Now, obviously the den has been moved. If the den was still where it used to be, the hyena den we're talking about, um, these hyenas would have been here already long ago. Uh, it's that close to where the den is. But because the den's moved, I don't even know if they'll hear this from where they are. It just goes to show also the time that we took just to get in, how long, how quick they were able to feed on this. It's absolutely insane. All right, well, we'll sit here and enjoy the chaos that will be these dogs on a kill. Um, in the meantime, let's send you across to Andrew. Well done, Tristan, on an amazing sighting on your side there. And we have an amazing sighting on our side as well. We've got two ostrich and there's a young one as well only seen the one youngster I'm just gonna give it a bit more time see if more of them shuffle out the bush but up until now it does seem like there's only the one there and there's a beautiful male coming out it'll be interesting if it's the same male and female with the young that we saw a few months ago I think it was about two months ago uh, yeah then if it's the same ones, then it seems like a lot of them are missing. But we can't say for sure yet because uh, there could be more behind the bush that we're just not seeing. That's pretty normal for ostrich. <clears throat> Very few of them actually make it to adulthood from the entire clutch. There we go. Look how they blend into that environment. So we're just off Clossy Access at the moment. So we're very central in the reserve at the moment. And uh, yeah, we've been drinking a lot of water. I see our water bottles are running low. We need to at some point make a plan, refill those water bottles. Let me just see if we can't see their neck sticking out the top there. But this is actually quite a nice area for meerkats that I've seen in the past. Always a good idea when you're around here just to squiz with the eyes, see if you can't see any animals standing upright. Now it's been a while since I've seen meerkats out here. It really is starting to cool down now. This is really what we need. <laughs> We've been battling a bit. But uh, we are feeling much more comfortable than what we were earlier on. And we can just see the ostrich just disappearing over the horizon. A little bit far off there. Ah, it's just gone behind the bush, so just centre where I'm pointing, sort of in that direction. And we'll just give it a moment, I'm sure they'll pop through again. Always a good place just to squeeze with binoculars, see if the blue cranes are on the reserve again. They usually hang around the Levenbosch pan area and Flossy pan area, which is not too far from where we are now. 
and I would love to show you the the, the grey herons, I mean the, the blue cranes, that would be really spectacular to show you. Okay, sounds like uh, Tristan is busy there on, on his side with some wild dogs. We're going to send you off there again and see what he's doing. They're still busy feeding. There's still a lot of this carcass left. We've positioned a little bit better where you can maybe see a bit of what they're eating. For those of you that are a little bit squeamish, it's probably a good time to turn away now. Um, you can see some of them don't even have a lot of blood on their face yet, so they haven't quite gotten stuck in. Uh, I think the chaos of the run and then where it's being killed, this is not a great place for dogs. Um, they can easily be ambushed in this. You can see there's thick, steep banks on all sides, multiple places that predators can come from, whether it be lion or leopard. Um, and so the dogs are quite wary. I've seen a lot of the adults go up onto the banks and they've been checking up high to try and see if they can see and then they've come back down. Now, don't be surprised if the likes of Mulawati or Tlalamba somehow miraculously appears here. Uh, it's the right kind of place for a leopard to hang around there and they will hear this if they're close and they'll come running. They know that a dog squeaking like this is food, the same as we know it. Um, and so if they hear it and they're close, they'll come. You can see the Now, sorry, Sinclair, I don't have your comms anymore. I can hear it coming through on Rion's, but I don't hear anything. I don't know if it's because we're in a dip, but we can't hear, so I'm just going to try and get my radio up a little bit. Um, it's weird, the comms were working fine, and then they just went off now. Um, but like I said, you know, this is the perfect place for some sort of ambush from... A predator. I'm trying to see what it is. It's a young male. It's that one young male that was with that group when we first came onto quarantine. And the dog that you're making the most noise is actually the puppy. Um, the two puppies are the ones feeding, so they're getting first preference. And you can see how cheeky they are. They chase others off in order to feed as much as they can, and then the adults will come once the puppies are done. Now it seems as though my radio doesn't want to work at all. Yeah, no, are you hearing anything? The rounds also not hearing anything. Um, I don't know if maybe because we're in this dip, we're struggling a little bit. Just want to turn this. So that's strange because sometimes radios when we're in dips like this just struggle a little bit. Um, normally we do all right. So hopefully it will work again because I know there was a question that came through but I couldn't hear anything. They're actually eating this much slower than normal. I think they're just letting the puppies eat first. Um, they're being nice to the puppies. All right, so now at least I can hear you again, which is good news. I've swapped radios with Rian, um, so we can at least hear what's going on. Um, so we're going to sit with these guys and see what they get up to. We have found ourselves a beautiful little spot to watch the last little bit of light coming over the top of the clouds. It is quite a formidable looking place.
cloud bank. So this is a very different scene to all of the action-packed stuff we've been getting from Tristan and, and the dogs and the ostriches and goodness gracious, this is total opposite. But it is a good time to just, I suppose, soak it in. massive weather change we've put on jackets the wind is picked up obviously these clouds are rolling in from the drakensberg mountains so we're looking almost straight west now and in fact if you look right at the bottom of the clouds you can just see the silhouette of those drakensberg mountains so the clouds are quite high up and i think over the coming days we're going to have very similar temperamental weather we're going to have hot days and then all of a sudden the clouds are going to start building because we're expecting a few more little spats of rain in the coming week. But you can hear it's a lot calmer now. The birds are starting to settle for the evening, finding a spot to roost. No hyenas calling, no lions calling, no leopards calling. I think we're a bit too far to hear the wild dogs calling, even if they were up on quarantine. I think my favorite thing about all of this is right on both edges of the clouds, right and left, just at the top you can see the sun is still hitting those clouds they're a completely different color it's like little flecks of gold and almost pink and orange in amongst that very stormy skyline a little bit of golden lining for the day and just a chance to take a deep breath Right, so we're with the dogs, our radios are good, we're all ready to go, which is happy, happy days. Um, so basically what we've got is the puppies feeding, some of the adults are slowly starting to feed now. Puppies are being naughty and chasing everybody off, but their stomachs are getting so distended now from eating. That I don't think they can eat much more, there's still a lot of this carcass left. Um, I, I've got a little bit more height than what Rian has, because I'm kind of kneeling on my chair. And I can see that there's still easily three quarters of this carcass left, maybe even more. The, the puppies have basically just eaten the internal organs and some of the back straps of this particular animal. And so there's still a long, long, long way to go. And if they carry on playing and making noise, then I'm sure things are gonna arrive. It's amazing to me that there's not a single hyena here. Um, it's unheard of in Juma for this long and this much of a commotion for no hyenas to get you. So I'm very, very, very surprised, but hopefully they will come soon. Now, before more pandemonium breaks out, given that we're with wild dogs and we've just been on a wild ride, it's time to tell you all about the wild show. Um, James Hendry, the one and only, is back and he will be hosting the brand new wild show. It's going to be a non-live series take on unfiltered, um, well, un live series takes on uh, unfiltered look at the epic animal encounters we have had over the years, um, which are a lot. And so I'm sure James will bring his usual unique sense of humor. And it's an invite for all of you to join him on this odyssey of incredible interactions and sightings that will leave you absolutely hooked, I hope. And with James Henry, it's most definitely going to be entertaining. So I would encourage all of you to go and have a look. It will be launching on Thursday the 1st of December at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time for our US viewers and then repeated at 7.30 p.m. Central African Time and 5.30 p.m. GMT for our South African and UK European viewers respectively. Whew, I'll get there in the end. This is like an Oscar speech. Um, I feel like... <laughs> I'm having to go through a lot here. Um, from next week, we will also be delivering a fresh new episode on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays with many repeats in between. Keep an eye on this channel schedule on our website to see when The Wild Show will be airing. The Wild Show is open to all our viewers to watch. Download the Wild Earth app from your local app store. We can't wait. I know I can't. It's going to be entertaining. It's going to be fun. Um, and James's 
quite possibly one of the most humorous people I know and so you should definitely tune in. I'll just give the times again so that everybody gets that because that was a lot. Um, so Thursday the 1st of December at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time for US viewers, 7.30 p.m. Central African Time and 5.30 p.m. GMT for South Africa, UK slash European viewers. Good. I wonder if this sighting will feature on James's show one day. It certainly was wild. So hopefully it will. Um, <laughs> on this weekend, actually, when we were doing this on the hunt and we were kind of going through all these old clips, I was quite staggered to see how many sightings we actually had um, on Juma. I thought it was going to be quite Mara heavy because obviously Mara is a much easier place to film. But we had a number of sightings on our Juma um, feeds. And so it was quite cool to see that we actually do quite well here in that regard. It's just much harder for our poor cam ops. I mean, you can see when we're chasing after dogs and you've got to get into thickets like this, they really do struggle. So I think Rian's done a sterling job trying to keep up with my driving. And the good news, everybody, I'm very excited, is that I didn't fall out the car today, um, which is amazing because we all know my track record with following wild dogs, which was far more kind of slow and steady when I did fall out than what we did today. But the difference was, is that quarantine doesn't have the same look that we were off-roading that time has. Um, and so I was fairly confident today that I'd be okay. In saying that though, Trishala almost came a cropper um, with Morgan on the back on quarantine, once looking for the honey goose. So a lot of you won't know what a honey goose is, but it was a white-tailed mongoose that Trishala thought was a honey badger. So we started to call it the honey goose. She went off-roading and hit a stump slash hole slash I don't know what and almost toppled sideways. So <laughs> there is a, a lot that goes on when following certain animals. Right, there's a few adults now starting to kind of try get in. And you see how the puppies are chasing them off? Look, naughty, eh? Very, very naughty. Now what we must listen for while we listen to all these uh, squittering sounds is that if we hear like this low growl and then almost like a bark, then we know that there's a predator around that is not a wild dog. I love the sounds that they make. Matriarch wannabe, um, no, uh, if you look at leopard, often if leopard make a kill, they go fetch the cubs and the cubs actually get to eat before they do. And then if you watch yesterday morning's um, sunrise safari, you'll see that Insumi ate the whole scrub here and Kuchava had nothing. Uh, so it's very possible that, um, you know, they let their cubs feed first. Um, hyenas sometimes will not also not eat and they will drag their carcass all the way to the den for the cubs to eat first so it's not unusual um, or something different lions it's not like that lions everybody free for all everyone must get what they can cheetah also a little bit although i've seen female cheetah too let the cubs feed after she's killed first um, and let them get some nutrition often the, the role of a mother is to make sure her cubs are well fed before she starts to eat herself I'm constantly trying to scan around just to see if there's anything coming. It's so difficult in here. A leopard could walk here without us ever knowing it's here. Um, but I'm just kind of scanning the banks just in case we see that little rosetted coat sliding through this emerald green thicket. Michael, no, not always. Um, with wild dogs, remember when we were talking earlier about hunting, I don't know if you, you might not have been watching earlier, um, but hunting, every individual within the pack has a role to play and some will chase one animal, some will chase another animal um, and so it's not necessarily that the alpha leads the, the, the pack because in, when you saw when we were coming up to quarantine the pack actually split. So yes there were some that were on the road but to the left and the right of the ones on the road there was actually dogs and it was the dogs that were kind of coming through the thicket on the left that actually broke first. Um, but what you do see with dogs is that generally when they're walking on a road and they spot something, the alphas are in front. And so they do kind of charge off first, but it's only because they're in front because the pack is following them and they see it first. 
Um, but if another part of the pack sees a prey animal, they'll go straight away and they'll try and get it. I'm going to keep quiet for a bit so you can listen to all this sound. Like I said, if you are a little bit sensitive, um, it's still going. And so turn your sound down if you don't want to hear tearing of a carcass um, because once the rest of the adults start getting involved then it will start to sound a lot worse um, for now the puppies don't have the same sort of jaw strength to be able to pull and break open carcasses and tear bone and flesh so just a warning for everybody all right we're going to sit with the dogs and see what else happens. Like I say, anything can really happen with them. In the meantime, though, it sounds like Tessa has some predator of her own. Turned onto Ledwood Road, not thinking that we would actually find the leopard, but just having a bit of a gut feel that we've done the other parts. We might as well try this because this is a highway for Langa and for Tlalamba and Maribs and Moluati. And lo and behold, we have got, it looks like lovely Miss Tlalamba. Oh, she is just beautiful. She's relaxing on a termite mound, looking so nice and golden in this light. She's given us a pretty tough job of trying to get in here. She's in the middle of a stand of bush willows and tambuertis, just east of the Mulawati. So it's been <laughs> quite something to try and get a view, but I'm just so happy that we pulled it off and we managed to spot her on the termite mound. Oh. She's trying to have a bit of a snooze, but it looks like those flies are irritating her. You can see she's constantly flicking her ears. She's even um, shaking her, her muscles just under her skin. Trying to kind of shift the coat. And her eye, what we can see of it, is glowing. It's just catching the last little bit of light. Leanne, I cannot agree with you more. She is such a stunning leopardess and I think just somebody that every single time we see her, it just, it never gets old. We never get tired of it. And I think she walks circles around us so much that sometimes, you know, we forget what it's like to have a static like this, just appreciating the moment. something so what I can tell you is even though it's behind a bush she is looking nice and rounded on the belly I don't know we've all been wondering and I suppose we'll only know for sure when we see her absolutely huge with suckle marks or with cubs. But she definitely looks nice and round and pregnant. How exciting would it be to have Tlalamba's cubs on Juma? I think she's just enjoying the noises, the, the the dusk chorus. She's chosen a decently sized termite mound and it's in such a good thicket that I think anything coming past would actually struggle to see her. So even though we've got a clear view at the moment through this little gap, she's pretty well camouflaged if something like an impala or a steenbuck decided to walk past. She's also got enough of a vantage point that she'll see, hopefully, and hear other predators coming. 
There aren't very many big trees directly around us though, so if she did make, need to make a quick escape from something, she'd have to move quite a distance before she got there. But she is the queen, so I don't think, well, I hope nobody will challenge her tonight. She'll have another successful night if things go to plan. I've just noticed she's got a spot pattern shaped like a heart just behind her right shoulder blade there, surrounded by rosettes that make up a bubble or a squarish shape, and a little heart right in the middle. I've never noticed that marking before. Wow, she's just so beautiful. So what we'll do, if she is settled here, which she looks like she is going to be, we might try and reposition just now and get around the front of her. But for now, we'll take the view that we can get because at least we're seeing that gorgeous face. I will say it is a massive relief that we've seen her so regularly on, well, when I say regularly, more than we have the last few months on, um, on Juma. It is awesome. Oh, on the tummy, on the chin, flat pose, beautiful. I just need to call her in on the radio quickly because I can hear another vehicle, I think on Gary Main. Our stations we have located on Tlalamba, she is currently static on a Shidulu. We're on Leadwood Road, just to the western side of the road, north of Gary Main, and the fire break in the uh, bush willow thickets. And we heard birds alarm calling earlier, but further back towards the drainage line. I wonder how long she's been here, if she could have covered that distance in that time. I don't think so. Perhaps they were alarming at another leopard or a hyena or they gave each other a fright. But you can see she's very alert, she's listening. She's trying to find a comfortable position and at the moment spatchcock chicken is the best one, kind of just splayed out on the tummy. I've never noticed before as well how big her paws are next to her face. <laughs> Amazing, I'm not the only one who's had some predator luck. It seems like all of us are just popping predators out of the woodwork at the moment. Kevin, I don't know what you've got, but well done. Yes, this I hear the predators are popping out of the woodwork and back here in Madikwe we've got a young female lioness that is putting up a real show for us. The rest of the pride is lying more to our right, we'll show you a little bit later on in the tall grass. The visual there is not too great but I'm sure. But we will reposition us and we'll get a view of them for you as well. Meantime, look at this beautiful long, young lioness. And I'm fairly certain they're all going to be coming, getting active quite soon.
Yes, beautiful. She actually came walking over. about a year old, just over a year, thereabout. You can still see, she's still got those spots, look, those cub spots. Yes, lions always, always do have spots. When they're born, it's more pronounced, and then they start fading. As they get there where she's licking, you can actually see there's a few spots there. Still, thank you, BK. This is what I love about lionesses. Right, well, we're still with the dogs. We're going to probably be our last little bit with them, especially where they are. I don't want to compromise their safety. Um, obviously, we try not to view dogs at night, and there's small dogs here. They're in a very, very, very tricky spot. And while I don't think they're going to have any worries, given that the Talamati and S8 are on Simambili, but far, far west, um, closer towards the campsite. Apparently, Mulawati's on a kill on Little Gauri. Clalumbas with Tess, Shudulu is apparently near Arethusa. We had tracks for Tavangumi going north this morning into Buffalo's Hook, or I think it was Tavangumi. Um, so that doesn't really leave any other culprits from the, the sort of spotted leopard world to come in here. There's not a single hyena that's arrived yet. How, I don't know. Um, and yeah, so I think the dogs are okay, but we don't want to be the source of something coming in here and... and unfortunately grabbing a puppy or something like that so we don't view the dogs at night so like i said this will be the last little bit that we'll do with them um 
Puppies still feeding, if you can believe it. They um, are still trying to ram more impala into themselves. Um, but yeah, they they full, full, full now, so it won't be much longer. And then I think they're going to start giving way to the adult dogs to finish this off. They shouldn't leave too much of this. It's a pity, like I say, that is a, there wasn't a leopard around because there's been quite a few opportunities to grab this kill. And there's actually such a beautiful tree here, not the one above where the dogs are, just to my right hand side. And there's a beautiful sort of sloped tamboeti that would make like a really nice place for a leopard just to kind of go up. You can see it here, this one that bends next to me here. Um, so you can imagine that big tree like that. It would obviously probably use the lower part of the tree where that fork is, but it's very, very pretty. And in the early morning light will just kind of bathe that tree. So it would have been quite cool, but that's just the wishful thinker in me trying to hope that maybe, just maybe, that there would have been a leopard and we would have had a few days of that because the dogs have fed quite well actually well the puppies have at least the the adults not so much but they weren't skinny 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 to start with anyway this afternoon they seemed like they had had a decent meal anyway uh, this morning i can't believe this little caramel dog is still eating look at the size of its tummy it's starting to Get that distended look on the sides. Here comes another dog. See how the dog ran away because I thought, there we go, puppy ran away. And so you see the adults coming in. Look at the frenzy comparison. No, don't drag it deeper into the bush. Like I said, I know this is not for everybody, but it's part of how things work out here and this is nature this is the way dogs feed um, it's not an ugly thing but anyway they drag it into a place where i'm not going to go any further given the time of the day all right we'll probably leave them here and let them carry on with their evening in the meantime let's go across to tessa and see what they are up to Not even just a princess, but the queen. She is being a little stubborn at the moment. She came down off the termite mound and disappeared. And we were trying to get around to see if we could find her again. And as I came past the termite mound, she was lying flat in the grass like this. And I just saw the tip of her tail move. So I had to quickly stop. She's literally a few meters in front of the vehicle. And she's actually being quite cute. Not only when she's alert like that, but she was kind of flicking the flies away and trying to roll around, but of course very well hidden in the thick clumps of grass. Luckily for us, she ended up lying flat here where we can actually see her, because where she was, we could not see her at all, other than the tip of her tail. She's definitely fixated on something. She's aiming her face there. She's pointed it towards the Mulawati. So she heard something she wasn't so happy with, but clearly not enough to keep her awake too long. You will hear another vehicle approaching the area. We do have another vehicle coming to join us because of course we all love the Queen of Juma. Jackie Tlalamba was born in 2017, so she is five years old. She's gorgeous, right? Amazing young girl. Clayton, I'm standing by. I've got your audio. You're still south of me. Keep coming north on Ledwood Road, and you should see me on your western side. She is just so gorgeous. And you know Tlalamba means mischievous, playful, all the good things that she is. Absolutely stunning girl. Yeah, Clayton, I'm just to your western side here, in the thicket.
<laughs> uh, Clayton, I think it'll be best if you come in from the southern side of the thicket, so maybe reverse 10 meters or so and then come in west. There's a nice clearing there through the bush willows. <laughs> so I'm just trying to get this vehicle into the sights in here. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. <laughs> It is such a thick area, I think it's really, really hard to to find a gap. Um, but I think it's, you know, it'll be worth it if he manages to find his way in. Um, but remember everyone, in aid of Animal Rights Day, so we're ho hosting a two-day um, interactive quiz on the 10th and 11th of December. So it tests your understanding of animals, it raises awareness for their rights. So if you want to get a team together, be sure to enter and take part in generating that awareness about animal rights because it's becoming a much more important focus globally. You can enter now, they are, the entries are open on the website until the 6th of December to come and join us for Quizmania. It is going to be epic and I cannot wait to see how all the teams do. Oh, hello girl, are you waking up? Did you hear something about Animal Rights Day? I'm hoping that my head doesn't pop in. I'm just trying to get the spotlight to show him where Columbia is. Sorry, there's a bit of noise. So it's the easiest way of, um, <laughs> hello girl, of communicating it is just showing with the light, just so that they can see more or less what they need to aim for here, because she's so flat in the grass, you won't see her unless she moves. So I'm just gonna shine the spotlight again, but just off to the side, so you might see a bit of a change in light. Just letting them know she's over here, because they're coming in from the other side now. They're coming in from the right-hand side from her tail. There we go, they've seen her. Fantastic. I mean, who doesn't love Columba, am I right? So it is that perfect time of the day now. The light is so tricky. So we can still see, but it is getting dark, so we can't see definition with the naked eye. This is why we love infrared, but it also means she might start getting active just now, now that she's fully awake. Well, we're going to wait and see if she does. For now, Kevin has got even more lions. Well done, Kevin. Now, since you of us lost, the whole pride came out. And for the time being, we're just going to stick with this dark mane. Such an impressive animal. We've got one of the lionesses a little bit further on, and the rest of them, I think, are slowly walking down the road. But we're going to first wait for him to get up. Then we're going to start following him, because I want you to see his full size, his full height when he gets up. Look at this inquisitive one. There's another one lying just just really close by it, and then we've got the larger line ness. Now just bear with us, we are two other vehicles here. your other lioness lying on the road and the big boy here to our right so let's stick with him until they get mobile and you can see the power in that back and the 
away and that those shoulders just see look how muscle he is. The light is still holding nicely for us, looking at, looking at a bird that flew over. There's a perfect picture opportunity. Oh, good boy. Just an overgrown pussycat. Thank you very much, Ashley. I think the same. Some very impressive coalition of male lions, most of them in the primers of their life. Just look at this one, Ashley. The, he's got a, such a full mane. Especially now when he sits up like that. He's the brother to the blonde one. I'm sure you guys that's watching regularly have seen one as well, he's the brother. Blonde one, we've got no idea where he is running around. We haven't seen him for a few days. Last time we saw him, he was on a water kill quite a distance from here. The rest of them are still lying around. Beautiful light in the eye there. Beautiful framing, BK, we all agree, huh? Right. Stunning light, st stunning animal, stunning evening setting in the air in Medikwe. That's definitely why they're the king of beasts. There's not an animal more regal and confident than a male lion. Especially not a specimen like this. So they got up, moved a little bit they normally do. And my best bet is in a few minutes time that they will start getting mobile again. The specific male is just over five years old. They as I know, lost their mother at quite a young age. And moved over here to the northeast part of Matikwe. Uh, they just pitched up the one day. There were initially four of them. But as they were etching out their own territory, so two of them unfortunately didn't make it. And they've been ruling the roost up here in the northeastern sector of Madikwe ever since. And my guess for a few years to come. Might hear a car maneuvering again. Light is still holding for the time being, but at some point B BK will switch us over to our infrared light.
speaker is going to get us set up for some low light forming in the meantime we're going to stay with them Okay, so I'm driving around now Spotlight and IR, so <coughs> this is where the reports of the Ngati Pride came from earlier today. So, they're somewhere in this block. Uh, they were seen on foot this morning uh, from, well, by one of the eco training student groups and instructor who were out doing trails training and walking and they, uh, they found them in the block. Um, nobody established a vehicle sighting as the block was very thick where they went into subsequently. So we know that they will probably start moving now and so we're just circling the block hoping that they will emerge. They might have crossed out already so it might be worthwhile having another vehicle doing a wider loop, maybe a little bit further north or east and I mean, um, they could very well be on the route to that buffalo, you never know. So I'm just going to do a few loops here and see if we can't get that last minute luck going again, you know, like we always do. It would be great if we can find those Ngati Pride members. It is a relatively thick block, lots of low shrubs, which uh, makes it difficult. Even now, so with the spotlight, we can only see about two, three, or four meters in. Uh, well, there's a new road. Let's, let's take this new road. Maybe, maybe we're lucky. Finally, it has started to cool down and now with some cooler temperatures, some of the animals start to come out now and uh, we are here at the Jackal Den site and we're busy watching at least one pup that seems like it's eating something there. Still trying to figure out what, uh, what it's got there, not sure. And I must say, this little pups have grown so much over the last 12 days that I haven't been here, 11 days, whatever it was. I'm definitely seeing a little bit of growth in them. They are looking very healthy and very fit. Oh, there's a southern boo boo calling. Just hiding behind that thicket there. I think Morgan's doing some good camera work there, getting uh, getting through those branches, and we still have a clear view of this jackal. I don't think it's going to be too long and they're going to start vocalizing and perhaps the adults are foraging and uh, they will vocalize within the territory out here. We did hear it uh, you know, a good 20 minutes ago so hopefully they do it again. And they're just slowly moving through there and coming back. Come on, little guy. There we go. Look at those dark, dark eyes. I just love those eyes. Look at that. I think that's definitely one of my favorite features with Jackal is those intense dark eyes. They're beautiful. There we go. Maybe heard something or smelled something. What a stunning face.
They're actually very smart animals and when you look into this animal's eyes you can see that there's definitely a level of, of, of smartness. Come on, show us what you got there. So of course I think the adults will return with some bits and bobs as they, they catch things out there for these young ones. So I'm thinking perhaps that's uh, you know a bit of maybe a leg of something that uh, this jackal was playing with earlier on. I'm not 100% sure. All I know is it was a bit, bit white in color. But they do also eat fruits and berries and things like that. So it's I'm not sure what actually this jackal is eating. And they love insects, of course. And we should expect the lambing season for impala to yeah to happen perhaps in the next few weeks now i know out in juma the impala lambs have already dropped what was it like a week or two weeks ago also you've also seen they already okay so there has been a few lambs that have been born already okay that's good news so we are now heading towards the beginning of december so yeah that was my my estimation here in the eastern cape i said uh sort of at the beginning of December. All right, I believe uh, Tristan is busy bumbling at the moment, so I'm going to send you through to him, see what he's busy with. It's interesting how it differs from place to place and how each area has slightly different timings for lambing season. And it will mostly be due to various factors I would imagine. Um, sometimes it can be quite late here too, especially if it's been a very very dry um, summer. We tend to see the lambs being born a little bit later, but it's not a lot, it's only a couple of weeks difference between this sort of time that they, they give birth. Anyway, we've left the dogs, obviously, there was the two puppies were running around in quarantine by themselves, which is not a great thing to be doing, and the rest of the pack was devouring that impala. I don't think there'll be anything left yeah, by now even, probably. Um, so we just decided to get out of there and to not stay, even though there was no other predators around, you just never know what's lurking. and. I would feel very bad. It's just not the right thing to do. You know, we have a, a set of rules and ethics here, and we try to stick with them as much as possible. In some places, they spotlight wild dogs, no problem. I, like I say, don't really like it. Um, they're noisy. They attract a lot of attention, and spotlighting them and, and potentially affecting their ability to see what's beyond the spotlight to me is just wrong in every shape and form. And so I don't think it's the right way to go about things. Um, but in saying that, also, it makes sense now. I was just kind of thinking in my mind why there was no hyenas. It's the first time I've ever had dogs in Juma and we're on a kill and hyenas not arriving. Uh, never, obviously, like something like a scrub here is different, but, you know, proper substantial impala kill. And so I was thinking about it and I was wondering why is that? Because we heard hyenas calling this morning on Juma. They were definitely around. But it makes sense now that if Mulawati's got an impala kill in Little Gauri, where the den is to where they're talking about is very close. And so they would have heard that and they would have gone. And I wonder if all the adults are not lying there waiting for scraps from him. And that's why they haven't come up this side to see what's going on and to come and investigate the commotion here. The thing is, though, is that they would have been far more likely to get food out of this than they are to get out of a leopard that's tree to kill. Leopards, yes, they'll drop a leg here and there, and they'll drop, you know, little bits. But if hyenas come two or three, they would have chased those dogs off that kill, and they would have been able to eat a substantial amount of impala. So it surprises me a little bit, but maybe it's just out of audio range for them, and quite far. All right, so I'm sure Tess is very excited because she finally got a leopard. I know she's been looking in the last couple of days, and so she's still with the queen. And let's see what Colum is up to.
so excited, Tristan. I am the happiest person. <laughs> We've got La Lamba drinking. We're just south of Twin Dams, almost at Baboon Pan now. She's on Juma, which is awesome. She's found a tiny little mud wallow to drink from. Not the clearest view of her face, but there is another vehicle in the sighting, so we're just giving her some distance while she's drinking. This is a fairly vulnerable position for any animal when they're down drinking water. So she needs to have some escape routes, she needs to have some space, and we'll gladly give it to her. She gave us quite the challenge to follow her, as expected, came straight down to the Malawati, crossed over on the fire break, luckily for us, but through the thickest of thick bush. <laughs> All the bush willows, all the tamboetis, we kept having to loop around the thickets and try and find her again. But listen to that sound of her lapping. She is a very thirsty girl. You will see though her ears have not stopped moving, constantly scanning for noises. She's just amazing. A literal breath of fresh air. Oh. <laughs> that little bush gave her a fright as it touched her tail. <laughs> She's on high alert after drinking. That must have been quite the fright. Hello, girl. Are you coming to say hello? Oh, this is amazing. She's going to walk straight past me. I'm so happy. She's okay. She stopped in front of us, so we're just gonna have to wait. She's just here, literally right in front of me. You can, might be able to see a bum. There's a head. Yay! There she is. Give her a little scratch. Hello, Kalamba. <laughs> wow. She is magnificent. Just going to give her a little space to continue walking on Garine and then we'll follow. She's about to approach Baboon Pan on her left and Twin Dams on her right. We might have a vehicle come into the front there at some point, but for now they're still giving some distance. Alright, let's move forward. Wow! That is incredible. Look, you can see her in front of us. <laughs> I'm so happy. I'm so, so, so happy. I'm going to have to try and give some space here. So I'm kind of just going to loop around the side. We're leapfrogging with Tala, which is Now she's literally right next to us. We are on higher ground a little bit. Alone, the other vehicle left. <laughs> Look at the tail moving. She is thinking. So now she's looking up Twin Dams Road. Do I do Twin Dams? Do I carry on and Gary Main? Do I do Baboon Pan? She's literally navigating the intersection at this point. With the tail going, she's thinking hard. It's as though she's calculating 
where the noise is coming from, which way do I think is going to be the safest or the most successful. But if you listen, all we can hear is insects and frogs. Yay, twin dams, this is epic. Okay, I'm hoping she's going to go straight up to the dam, so we're going to follow and hopefully we can keep up with her for as long as possible. At Wild Earth, we believe that people will see animal rights as worthy by recognizing that they have emotions like us. In support of Animal Rights Day, we are hosting Quiz Mania. Teams will pit against each other in two days of interactive fun on The Sunset Show. How cool is this? To enter, form a team of two or more people, fill out the form on our website, and name your team. See you there. The whole pride is actually now lying out here on the road. The lionesses and the youngsters here to our right. And the big male, like he's on show, right here in front of our vehicle. Sorry about the vehicle at 10 out there, guys. He's lying 10 meters in front of the car. They get up and they move a little bit and they're lying down again. They're sussing out the environment. They're listening. They're all up now here on the right again, so I'm sure there's going to be movement again very soon. Well, the mosquitoes are buzzing around our ears. Nicole, no, I don't, don't really think so. I think his mane will, 
Oh, yes. We'll stay that colour. It might fill out a little bit still. Now, my lines only really come into their prime Nicole around about seven years old. And these guys are just over, over five, five and a half, thereabout. So his mane might fill out a little bit more. Imagine what he's going to look like then. But I don't think the mane will get much darker than what it is. I see he's waiting for the lionesses to move. There we go. We've got the lions on the move, and guess what? Yes, we're going to move with them. So we're going to very soon start up and follow them at a respectful distance. There we go. Let's see what they get up to. Hoppa, get us out on the road here. Well, Tristan has got a predator of a different kind, and we're going to head over him to him, and let's go and have a look while we follow these lions. We do have a predator of a different kind, a little predator. Um, poor Rian's trying, but the wind keeps coming up in little gusts, blowing this little green pea spider all over the place. Um, and I kid you not that that is its name. Um, for those of you that are new to Wild Earth and think that I'm just making it up because I don't know it, but they are called green pea spiders. And they have this green abdomen and that looks just like a little pea and that's why it gets that name. Now it's tricky, like I say, because the wind is changing the focal plane. I mean, you're this close and, and this shallow a depth of field, it's very, very difficult. So you might see it bouncing in and out a little bit, um, but Rian is doing his absolute best to try and keep it in frame. Now it's just built a little web on this uh, wattle that's behind it. You can see a bit of the tree behind it. And so it will be hoping that little insects will be coming around. Really wind? There was no wind when we were framing this up. And now all the wind in the world has just come and blown our little poor spider all over the place. <laughs> Shame little spider. It's not easy to be a spider in the windy world. I feel like that could be on a t-shirt or something. Um, but the little guy will be hoping for insects just to kind of come along, fly in, can then profit off that. After the rains, there should be a fair amount of insects flying about. And so lots of good nutrition for a little spider on the edge of a road. And insects often actually, funny enough, use roads when they're in their flight path because it's clear and devoid of vegetation. And that means that they can fly really easily without having to worry too much at night. So you often see a lot of insects. That's why insects hit you in the face when you're on safari in the evenings. Because, you know, as you're driving along, they're flying along on this open part. And then you get hit. And it's the same as why nightjars sit on the road uh, and various other operators of the night are close to road areas. Yeah, unfortunately a little bit too windy tonight to really show you much great detail about this little spider. Sorry, Rian. My fault. I shouldn't have pointed it out in this wind. Margot, so you're saying you can't believe something so small is a predator? I know, crazy, isn't it, when you think about it? And I wonder which Margot this is. Maybe it's Margot all the way from London. If it is Margot, hello. Um, Margot... Um, from London is somebody that uh, I've been on safari with a couple times and have planned some very cool adventures going forward. Uh, she runs a kind of a set of books basically. She does Remembering Wildlife, if it's that Margo. Um, and they uh, basically every year choose an animal and um, they raise awareness for that animal through a collection of the best photographs they can find. Um, from photographers all over the world that donate. It's a pretty epic thing to do. Um, and she's done amazing work and raised a lot of money for wildlife. And it's been an absolute honor and privilege to be a part of it. Uh, you know, like I say, as photographers, we donate an image uh, that goes into the book. 
and all of her work has done a lot for wildlife across the world. So if it is you, hello Margo, nice to <laughs> see that you're watching and asking questions. Um, but it's crazy that spiders are, are predators just like the wild dogs and the chaos that they have. Uh, and I love the spider world. I mean, I know Ben, ben and I were actually having a long chat about this. Ben has delved deep into the spiders of late. Uh, and I really enjoy spiders too. I think there's something fascinating about them. And particularly when we used to do bushwalk, I used to really enjoy trying to find spiders, those orb webs. Um, I know some people get super creeped out by spiders, but when you actually start to read about them and the mechanisms that they have in order to do what they do, they're fascinating creatures and deserve just as much attention as anything else out here, uh, as most things do. Uh, when you start delving into the ins insect world, you start to realize just how small um, our knowledge is of, of it and how little we scratch the surface of insects and the intricacies of them in general. And I mean, I know this is an arachnid and not an insect, but we're just kind of clumping everything together in one sentence. Um, so don't shout at me, those of you. That's our um, scientific in mind. I, I fully get that this is not necessarily classified as an insect. Um, but yeah, they, a bug. It's even worse term actually. I should slap myself on the wrist for that. You can see how it's using its little legs to come down. All right, that gust of wind is it. We're going to leave the spider. Uh, otherwise, Rian is going to cause somebody at home to get sick by trying to focus on a spider that's bouncing around all over the frame. It's going to not be good for anyone. Okay, well, we're slowly going to start bumbling home. I mean, it is that time. I forgot how late it is, actually. I was just immersed in my own world. We saw Janet for a little bit, so I was watching that and kind of just daydreaming a little bit, as one does sometimes at this time of the night on a game drive as you get lost in your own thoughts. Um, so <laughs> it's that time to actually start heading home. So we're going to start heading in that direction. Maybe we'll get lucky with something on the way. starting to move again. <laughs> we had a Varose Eagle Owl and of course, I mean, you know how it goes, they know the show's language. Live, live, gone. Actually, they preempt it. They preempt the live, live. I'm telling you. It flew away. It sat so beautifully and then flew away. But it was gorgeous up on a dead tree stump right at the top looking for food I wonder if it's the same pair that used to be around um, Philemon's dip we haven't seen them there in a while we are close by, we're at uh, Junction Pangolin Track Weaver's Nest so very close to Philemon's dip but just as an update for everyone as well obviously an owl and me driving is not a lumber we managed to follow her when she finished drinking, she went past the twin, like the little pan system south of Twin Dams, and then she kind of cut across onto the fire break to that beautiful big torchwood, the Balanites tree, sent marked and just disappeared straight northwest into the block. And we tried to follow her and we literally just couldn't keep up. It's so thick. So we decided, all right, she's on a mission. Let's leave her to it. I'm sure we'll be able to find some tracks in the morning and hopefully Tristan will be able to find her. <laughs> The lumber walks circles around me when I'm tracking it. I have no problem admitting that she walks circles around me. But when I don't track her, then I find her, like tonight. We just had a gut feel to check that part of the reserve. Didn't track. Not that I've never tracked her, I absolutely have, but she just tends to walk square circles around most of us. not as easily trackable as other leopards with those big loops that she does all over the property. But I just feel really, really, really happy that we got to spend some time with her today and find her and just appreciate her. She's so beautiful. Our queen of Juma. Hopefully soon to have princes and princesses.
wish you guys can see the ambient light outside because we're now on infrared light. And we can't see this lioness. She's lying. There we go. Now you can see it. Thank you, Vika. It's as easy as a flick of a switch. How amazing. Technology is a good thing because it was up to us. We would not have seen this lioness with our naked eyes lying 20 meters in front of the vehicle. The rest of the pride are slowly moving off into the tall grass. We are going to stick with her here at the back until she gets up. And if you guys can just very briefly bear with me, I just need to answer the radio. Oh, here's a, here's a cup to your right. We don't even see it. Joseph, that is much appreciated. I will always say, and you'll hear me say it often, the thing that makes us stick, Joseph, is to share this with you. I'm just going to quickly make a radio call. Thomas, Thomas, Kevin. All right, Thomas, I've got uh, one Musadi, one banner here by me in front of the vehicle where I'm pointing. And the rest of them are a little bit deeper in. I'm not sure if they're mobile or not. Okay, copy that. Um, I don't think I'll stay too long because I don't have a spotlight. No worries, if you look in there, you will see them that side. You can hear them calling. Here she goes. <laughs> I'm going to move a little bit in just so we can get to the edge of the infrared light again. Good to go, BK. I'm going to stop here, BK. There we go. And now as we're watching them slinking off into the complete darkness, that is probably where we're going to leave them, guys. We're not going to follow any further. And that is now to give them time to hunt. They have had visitors on and off. I won't say most of the day, that is, that is, that is an overstatement, but they've had the whole afternoon and had people looking at them. It's now their time, it's now lion time. Brenda, that was very special. Always love the interaction between cubs or juveniles in this instance. Always love that. Thank you, Brenda. And of course, for everybody joining us on our Sunset Safari. So on behalf of myself, Kevin and BK here in Madikwe, Tessa and Tristan and Chris, Andrew and Lisa, thank you so much. And there we lost complete sight of it, of them. A, almost a fitting moment to say good night to everybody. We'll see you at sunrise safari time. may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised.